you have the advantage of not having to talk to people who are hungry. But now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, yes. So, yeah, we are now comparing, uh, yeah, the Boston and Boulder AMG with our AMG, uh, with our D Alpha AMG. Um, yeah, the Boston and Boulder AMG was the first one for lattice QCD by Brannick, Brauer, Clark, Osborne, et al published in these references here. Mm. And um, yeah, first of all, I would like to compare the ingredients to yeah, find out where are the differences, where and which, what we got in common. So first of all, the interpolation is basically the same. So the kind, the, so um, the, the structure of the interpolation is the same. It's both gamma five compatible aggregation and yes, the difference, the main difference, the major difference is the smoother. We have this SAP smoother, and um, the the uh, AMG code uses the GCR as a smoother, the generalized conjugate residual method. So, um, as it has the advantages that it ha uh, that it uh, makes use of data locality and arithmetic arithmetic intensity, so we are just uh, solving these small block systems, so we are doing work very locally, since we are solving block systems, and we're just running. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, we are just running through the configuration and the vector a single time, but very slowly since we are solving these systems. And the GCR method is, if you're doing four iterations of GCR, it has to run four times through, through yeah, the, 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 the configuration, and some vectors have to run four times entirely through the cache. So this is probably slower if, um, yeah, uh, if um, bandwidth is an issue. And yeah, it's also, better for uh, large parallel cases because uh, it avoids communication since you're just uh, yeah, updating this residual once. Um, and um, so you have these uh, yeah, two communication steps when you're updating the residual for each color. And that's it. The other t uh, within uh, the rest of the time, you just uh, calculate block, block residues, and you can also uh, overlap this so you can calculate the boundaries, but doing block source which are not involved in, yeah, which are not neighboring to boundary cells. So blocks which are in the inner, in, in the inner domain of a process. So, okay, um, so it's communication avoiding, and GCR has to communicate all boundaries in every iteration, so this is also in. In the number is also higher, the number of communication steps. Um, okay, and uh, the setup procedure is also different. So as I already explained, we have this inverse iteration using our method itself, and this, uh, yeah, this kind of bootstrapping approach in terms of using the method itself speeds up the whole inverse iteration process. Um, yeah, and in, within the code, not necessarily within the AMG method, but within the code, we, uh, we have um, uh, also an inverse iteration approach using the smoother or even by CG step. And uh, yeah, then we know that we have a convergent inverse iteration, but uh, still it's kind of slower. So in this case, we also have no convergence guarantee. We are just using the V cycle. We have we don't know if the smoother converges, and the whole multigrid method doesn't have to converge if we do not wrap an outer Krylov subspace method around it. Okay, and with respect to the implementation, we just figured out that the, the QOP QDP code needs very long time to set up uh, the coarse grid. Uh, the, it's not not the coarse grid, the coarse grid operator. So. In order to build the coarse grid operator, it needed a lot of time. This is probably the reason uh, why it doesn't 
use a bootstra bootstrap approach because in, within this bootstrap approach, you have to update after each uh, yeah, after each iteration of this inverse iteration, you have to update your uh, core script operator. So we are like too expensive. And this is also maybe, this limitation is probably a reason why this kind of setup procedure was used in the code. Um, on the other hand, we don't have SSE optimization. The QOP, QEP code has SSE optimization. We switched it off for our numerical uh, tests and for a fair comparison, but if, if we just switch it on, of course, then our code is not fast enough right now. And it's publicly available. Our code is not yet, but when we have implemented SSE optimization and stuff like that and documented it well, maybe then we can publish it. Uh, publish it. What speeds up your course grade? The, um, um, well, yeah, um, so the, the setting up the core, yeah, the, co the, con the construction of our course grid operator, um, yeah, I, had, I didn't have a look at what he's doing, but I assume that we are just doing it more cleverly since we are just really taking the right things of, out of the vectors and then just applying it to the coupling matrix and projecting it down and using all the structure that we have just for this speci special case of gamma 5 compatibility. Well, compatibility. It's, it's with the coding problem, not Yeah, exactly it's a coding problem, problem definitely. Probably, I would say, yeah. 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 So it's just a coding problem. And yeah, it's a coding problem, definitely. But we saw a difference of a factor of twenty or something like that. But yeah, it's a coding problem. Yeah. But this coding problem also really affects that he's doing a different setup procedure than and not doing the most. Yeah, it's the easiest thing, thing to do, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, also, the code supports both uh, gamma five compatibility or just yeah the the Lucia kind of aggregation without gamma five compatibility. You can switch in between, and then you have to have it maybe more flexible, uh, which is not which we don't have. So yeah, this is also a reason maybe. Okay, uh, let's have a look at first of all. Uh, a comparison within a common framework. So we just used GMRES as a smoother. And um, yeah, first of all, we want to have a look at the weak scaling of SAP and GMRES of 100. 100. So we, we looked at GMRES instead of GCR, but in general, there's no difference in, within the scaling behavior of both methods. And um, also, they produce the same number of iterations in all cases that I have seen when we applied the solver. It's just a minor difference of like 5 or 3 percent in runtime that you save if you use GCR. Um, OK, and we see here that at some point, at 2 to the 10 or 2 to the 11 uh, processes, GMRES starts uh, yeah, suffering from, uh, yeah, from communication issues. And um, um, we have also profiled this, and profiling has shown that it's due to all-to-all -all communication, not to next neighbor communication. And uh, SAP has no all-to-all -all communication. There are no dot products within SAP. And yeah, that's why you see it here in GMRES, but not in SAP. So this is the first advantage. Then we have a strong scaling study. Uh, we uh, solved uh, 64 times, uh, yeah, 64 times 32 cube problem. Um, that was configuration number two. And um, there should be actually some dashed line in between. I don't know. It's, uh, so the optimal scaling would go from this one, from this point to this. And we see that uh, GM, that flexible GM rest, no, that GM rest itself slightly overscales, that can happen. This is just to, uh, due to cache effects. Uh, so, so this is due to bandwidth problems. If you apply GMRES and go to 
a small number of processes, then you have a very large local lattice, and then it's uh, yeah, then it's uh, yeah, you just see cache effects. It's just slowing down due to streaming all these large long vectors all the time through the cache, and that slows you down. This problem is not the case for SAP, and uh, it's just slightly underscaling due to uh, yeah, due to next neighbor communication which we have also profiled. So to some extent, next neighbor communication gets more expensive when you have more processes involved. OK. Um, and now a comparison within a, com uh, within a common framework for just two levels at the moment. And uh, both methods were tuned independently. And uh, we have used the bo for both methods now the bootstrap setup procedure within our uh, framework. So just to see the difference uh, between the two smoothness. And um, we see here now there's just a small difference in between uh, both setups since, since the smoothers seem the, 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 the GM REST as a smoother seems to be slightly more expensive. And if we just have a look here at the smoother time, uh, in the, no, let's have a look first at the soft. So uh, within the soft time, we see here, um, yes, a, a difference of yeah, 0.7 seconds. And um, if we just look at the smoother, uh, it's, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, for, for the smoother, we have 0.6 seconds uh, for GM REST and 0.4 seconds for uh, DD Alpha MG. So this is a factor of 1.5 that you need more for smoothing for GM REST as a smoother. And um, well, but in total time, you don't see a big difference. It's just a minor difference for um, um, yeah for a two-level method. But if you just consider a three or four-level method if it works, then um, this factor of 1.5 could take over to the total runtime, and that's what we see here. So a comparison within a common code framework for four levels, and here we see that this now applies to the solve time and also to the setup time. We have this speed up factor of 1.5. Okay, and now a comparison with uh, the official AMG implementation in QOP QDP. And yeah, we have um, a comparison for different configurations here, for, for, different, for configuration three and four. I think as far as I remember, configuration four was an unsmeared 128 times 64 to the three lattice. And configuration three was the smeared BMW lattice uh, 64 to four. Yeah, that's it. And um, AMG uh, dash D uh, uses the default parameters for AMG, and AMG uh, yeah AMG K uses K iterations of GCR per inverse iteration step, or I think it's by CG step then. So. K iterations of by CG step per inverse iteration step. Um, and for our method, we just took the default parameters that I showed you in the beginning. Um, and what we see here, so this is, uh, for, so for the, for the small parallelizations, um, what do we see here? I, I, I don't remember the slides that well, I have to, uh, to admit. Um, OK, um, the setup time, so for, for, the, for the default parameters, the setup time is three times as long as for the alpha AMG. And if we just tune uh, AMG, the, the AMG setup, that, um, that, it's, um, that, it's, yeah, that it's expensive as it is for the DD alpha AMG method, then it's slower, and for the um, yeah, for the um, default parameters, it's faster. This is the case for both tries here. But um, yeah, so in our case, the setup was not able to, uh, we were not able to drive the setup to the extreme. So if we do more setup, th there's some, some limit for us. 
because of the non-convergent iteration, the inverse iteration maybe. So we weren't able to get better, much better test vectors than those here. But uh, this convergent kind of in inverse iteration uh, here in this uh, default case of AMG was able to provide a faster method. It still needs more iterations, but this is due to smoothing less and also to uh, le less accuracy on the core script. So each iteration of AMG D is uh, less expensive. So in iteration count, we, we can't compare it actually, but I just stated the, those numbers. Okay, and in a, in a parallel case, uh, in a case with larger parallelism, um, we see that no matter if you do, uh, if you take um, the default parameter set or an, uh, yeah, an, an equally expensive setup, um, the DD alpha AMG code outperforms the AMG code in both cases. So maybe this is also due to the, the core script operator, the application of the core script operator in the AMG code being more expensive than ours, maybe due to not being able to hide yeah, communication as our core script operator does, I would. What is your core script operator to hide um, so the, the uh, communication scheme, how, how it's implemented, or? or yeah, the core script, yeah. it's the application of the core script operator. Yeah, so, so the application of the core script operator works as our uh, fine grid operator in principle, and uh, yeah, we, um, we have a, yeah, evaluation scheme which was invented by Stefan Krieg, and it's, uh, it was invented for the blue gene P, and um, yes, it's just based on uh, hiding as much uh, communication as possible. So it starts a communication, then you run through the whole configuration once for the positive directions, then you stop this, uh, this uh, communication, then you run the communication for, uh, for the other direction and run again through the whole configuration. So, you, so each time when you communicate, you run once over the whole configuration. And this is also done that way on the so core script. So we're hiding it. It's it's yeah. coding on this level. So it's all coding. Uh, these differences in these, um, but yeah, on, on in this table are basically just all to due to coding effects. I would say. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Yeah, that's it mostly. Okay. Um, yeah, a small summary. Uh, the Schwartz smoother speeds up, uh, shows a slight speed up for two levels and a speed up factor of 1.5 for four levels. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, with respect to coding, the DDR5 AMG code um, yeah, is faster than QOP, QDP for large parallelizations. For small parallelizations, the setup is cheaper, but the solver is slower, and uh, the iteration uh, count is always lower for, than for QOP, QDP. Okay, and what we are looking for to do as soon as possible is improving our setup procedure still a bit. We think that there's still some discussion open what to do and which is what's the right way to go. Uh, yeah, what kind of setup to do. And uh, yes, uh, implement some optimizations and then maybe making it open source. Okay, and I would like to thank you. The the QOP QDP code is available. Uh, is, where is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, James Osborne. But it's, I mean, Cyrex software. All Cyrex software is available in all the web. Yeah. All of the Cyrex software is available in all the web. Oh, 
No, but I didn't know it was a developer. It's very easy. Yeah. It is a lot. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, we can't even know what we're doing about a job. Yeah. Not yet. Hopefully, yes, we are planning to do that. I have I have no idea when this is exactly. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it's never going to be a per <laughs> per uh, perfect world. Some people will document, some people will not, no matter what. Yeah. Some, never stop <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. some people consider their code so obvious that it's self documents. Uh, yeah. Sorry? But, um, well, it's all going to be on GPUs. We'll get tomorrow, so then it'll be faster for two yeah. reasons. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that was great, very good, interesting. You you actually did the work to do some comparison, which very yeah. few people have done as well. So that's great. Thank you. It's very informative. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the next slide. Oh, Mike, had a question or not? Yeah. Go ahead. yeah. Um, so you can make GMRS trivially sell uh, as much vector yeah. to S step variants. So to sw switching to what? S step. S step. S -step. Okay. It's a way of delaying the global log optimization. Ah, uh, uh, One big um, policy argument. Ah, uh, you you're talking about pipelining or? It's yeah. It's you reorganize the operations of yeah. the so You end up in a bunch of these yeah. a bunch of matrix factors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. 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 yeah of course. Uh, good comment. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So we will end up not all right, so uh, well, I think you were at previous QCE events. Huh? Is this your first QCE? No. no. Uh, I've been to the one, actually in Yale was my first one. OK. And then in Boston in 2010. Okay. All right, so here we go. Let's get started. All right. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is basically, um, well, it's, it's some work that we kind of built upon what uh, Matthias just told us. So basically, we said now we are at the point where we think uh, solving Dirac Wilson is cheap. Uh, so what can we do about it? And what can we do with it, with this fact? And the idea was, and because we are involved in the overlap business for quite a while, so Andreas Frommer, our uh, um, boss, kind of started to work in this field on, uh, on the overlap operator, I guess, 10 to 15 years ago. He started to work on this. So somehow it was always something in our minds uh, to work on the overlap operator. And I think uh, some of the ideas that we used, actually, um, I think I discussed with some of the people around here in 2010 in Boston already. And uh, on the way there, I think I made some interesting discoveries, at least mathematically interesting, which, uh, I don't know, I'll ask questions to the physicist audience uh, at these points where I don't know. I mean, I found things kind of uh, interesting and surprising, and I don't know if you agree or not. So let's get started. So what are we talking about? We are talking about uh, kind of, again, of course, we're sort of the stupid linear algebra guys. So all we can do is solve linear systems of equations. So what do we want to solve? We want to solve this linear equation, which is uh, with a set of linear equations given by this uh, Neuberg or overlap operator in this talk denoted hopefully consistently with dn. And what is this? Uh, what is this beast? It's sort of, uh, 
a bit more intricate. So what you see and what we actually tried to figure out two weeks ago is uh, why is this actually a discretization of the Dirac equation? And uh, reading Neuberger's paper, we actually could figure it out. I mean, it was not, somehow it's not completely trivial to see that this is a discretization of the Dirac equation. I mean, to me, at least in my mind, it wasn't. But you can, believe me, this is a discretization of the Dirac uh, equation as long as your kernel operator, what's called the kernel operator, and here you can plug in basically any discretization which is doubler free. I think this is the only assumption that you need. And it has, I mean, it is a discretization of the Dirac equation, that's all. So let's, for now, we will always think about the Wilson discretization here, just to make it simple. I guess you can formulate this with other discretizations as well, but for now, this will always be the Dirac Wilson operator. And I'm going to have a cartoon on the construction of this in a, in a special case, which kind of makes it clear what this actually is. It looks kind of very funny. So what do we do? We have this shift here, the M0, which is sort of important in the construction, and we will see why. So we shift our Dirac Wilson operator, and basically you think you can think of your shifting your burger kind of right to the point where uh, the origin is inside of the first hole, hopefully hole. Uh, then you take kind of the symmetric version of the operator, so you get, take gamma five times the shifted Wilson. You compute the sine function of this matrix, and this is kind of where Andreas Frommer got involved uh, in the first place, because of course now this is a matrix function here which is, if you want to calculate it directly, it's dense. It's a dense matrix. It's way too large to do, unless you're interested in four to the four uh, examples. So you never want to calculate this directly. Uh, what do you do after? So now this is a matrix here. If you just look at the matrix, it's a fairly simple matrix. It's a unitary matrix, which only has eigenvalues with minus one and one. You multiply with another unitary matrix. Now this is a unitary matrix which has eigenvalues all on the unit circle. You shift it again by, by one, and then you scale it again. So basically, now what this ends up being is just a, just a circle with midpoint uh, m, well, what is it exa exactly? m0n minus m half. And then you add this mass shift to get the right uh, uh, fermion mass. OK, so gamma 5 times the sine of this. No. Gamma five No. Th this, just this part, just gamma five times the sine function. It's a unitary matrix times a unitary matrix. It's a unitary matrix. Gamma five is a unitary matrix. In, not for this, no. In the end, okay. So in the end, and this is, I mean, I, I will come back to this. So basically, the, the in the simplest mathematical expression that you can uh, that you can say is. The, uh, the Neuberg overlap operator is a shifted unitary matrix. That's what it is. Exactly. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. okay. No problem. No problem. I need more coffee. Okay. Um, okay, and we, I mean, kind of, where, where does this come from? This comes from the fact that uh, people have thought about uh, bringing chirality onto the lattice and figured out that you can't do it directly. There is this no-go theorem, the, the, the famous no-go theorem that was cited this morning already. And uh, what you can do is kind of get some asymptotic chirality on the lattice where you have some higher order terms which go to zero when your lattice spacing goes to zero, kind of in a continuum limit. So now what is the problem? The problem is that, OK, so you cannot calculate this operator in the first place, this is a dense matrix. You don't want to do this. Uh, you can actually show that this is a, a kind of a matrix with ex exponentially decaying entries uh, outside of the diagonal. So it's sort of local, but it's not in the sense that you only have a limited number of entries per, per row of this matrix. Uh, so what you actually can do, or what has been done um, so far, is well, you, you say, OK, I want to solve this linear system of equation. I use a Krylov subspace method for this. So the only thing that I actually need is the, the action of this operator on a vector, because that's on, the, the only thing that I need for a Krylov subspace method is how does my operator act on a vector. And then basically, I don't have to calculate this, the, sine, uh, the sine function of this matrix function per se, but I only have to calculate the, si the, the matrix function times the vector, which is much simpler. And people have thought about this. And what I'm going to focus on, or in some sense, what I'm going to mention in the end is one particular way how to solve this problem of evaluating the sine function. And 
kind of this this way of writing it down is this is nothing else than the, than basically the sign function up here. Uh, you can write, of course, the sign function as just the operator. This uh, divided by basically the absolute value of the operator, in a sense. So this here is nothing else than the sign function of hw, uh, is basically hw times the inverse square root. And I'm going to come back to this later on, how to evaluate this function. Yes? Uh, yes, you say that it's, uh, yes you, I mean, under certain assumptions, which I'm going to get to later on. Basically, if your if your gauge field is is smooth enough in some sense, then you can show this. I think this goes back to a paper. I, I'm not sure. Was it the Lucia paper or was it somebody else? I'm not completely sure. Either it was Neuberger or Lucia. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's not interesting. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So. Okay. But. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there are basically two things that I'm going to touch. The first thing is, of course, well, I mean, now you look at this. Uh, evaluating this this matrix function is expensive. It's it's doable. People have done it. People do it, but it's expensive. And if you would not do anything in particular to speed up this calculation of this of the basically of this uh, mat matrix function evaluation. And if you just look at how fast does this Krylov subspace method apply to this linear system of equations um, converge, you figure out, well, you might need in the order of 1,000 iterations. So you need 1,000 evaluation of the sine function. So this is quite expensive. So the first thing we want, or we, we had ideas about, is how to reduce this number of iterations. And the other thing which we touched basically uh, recently is, how do you get this uh, evaluation of this matrix functions, which is basically equivalent to evaluating the sine function, but kind of implicitly by re rewriting it in this way. So how can you evaluate the inverse square root more efficiently than what has been done before? So let, let's talk about the first challenge. And of course, the first challenge is kind of what do you do if your Krylov subspace method needs too many iterations? Well, you think about preconditioning. I mean, what else can you do? Okay. What people have done so far is always just, I mean, in some sense, use deflation. I mean, deflation is what people have done so far, I guess, in, in a Neuberger overlap a calculations. Because it's, it's not completely clear what is a good preconditioner, but hopefully I can motivate why we think we have found a very good preconditioner and why it's fairly simple which one to use. OK, so the, the, the main idea is, of course, we want to use a preconditioner. And of course, I write here suitable in uh, parentheses because what is suitable? Of course, suitable in the terms of uh, preconditioning is always, it should be spectrally equivalent. And uh, so I talked about this, or I mean, kind of, we are in the process of writing up a paper which should at least be uh, available as a preprint in like one or two weeks. And uh, James got involved, or is involved in this whole process. And he, he nicely put it this way. What we do is actually nothing else than what is called in the literature auxiliary space preconditioning. And the idea is, in, in certain uh, applications, fairly simple to understand. And it's, it's also nicely uh, characterizing what we do here. So what is meant by auxiliary space preconditioning? Basically, what you do in auxiliary space preconditioning is you do not, I mean, you have some problem that is defined by an operator. And now what you do is basically you define a similar operator, which is much easier to solve, or where you think you have a good solver for. And the only thing that you basically need to have is that it's spectrally equivalent. It's fairly easy to understand what, where this came from is basically if you look at, um, I think the first occurrence was uh, for the low order, high order case. So think about a partial differential equation that you want to discretize with a high order scheme. Let's say you have a finite element scheme of order four, and now you, figure, now you see your matrix is quite dense. You have a large matrix. And what people have done a lot is, well, you use a low order scheme, like let's say with linear finite elements, to precondition your high order scheme. The low order scheme, you might have a multi-grid method in your, in your drawer that you can throw at it so it's very fast. And typically, because it's still the same problem you're looking at, right? It's the same PDE. The one is just with a high order scheme discretized, and the other one with a low order scheme. It should still kind of represent the same problem. So it is reasonable to assume that this is a good preconditioner. OK? 
Okay, the same goes for conforming or non-conforming finite elements. So people have preconditioned non-conforming finite elements with conforming ones because there you have nice, nice solvers. You have the whole package. You don't have to think about it. You can solve it. And the same thing, in a sense, you can say about the Neuberger overlap. So basically what we want to do is we want to use a low chirality operator. I mean, I should have put this in parentheses. Uh, it's a. Right. Right. Have jumps. Exactly. In a sense, it's worse, but it's. Low. Yeah. Depends on your problem. Exactly. Okay. It's it's just an example where people have used this. Uh, I wanted to mention. So basically, our idea is, or, or what I mean, basically the idea was came before, but then then James mentioned that this actually fits in this into this framework. What we actually do or propose is we use a low chiral operator to to precondition the Neuberger operator in a sense. And mathematically, actually, what we do is we uh, take this actually normal operator. The Neuberger operator is a is a normal matrix. And uh, precondition it with a with a non-normal matrix, and actually the quality of the preconditioner depends on the normality of our preconditioner. Or I, I try to to motivate this in a minute. Okay, so the idea is just we use an auxiliary space preconditioner to precondition the Neuberger overlap, and what do we use? Well, we use the kernel operator. Okay, sounds simple enough. Uh, now, of course, you might ask, well, does this make any sense whatsoever? So basically, the, the thing that I propose is we use the Neuberg overlap as this kernel operator, and we think about it as the Wilson uh, operator uh, has it in it, and it was used to construct the Neuberg operator, and now I propose just to use the inverse of the Wilson operator to precondition the Neuberg iteration. Well, the mass is a bit tricky, but we think we figured out how to adjust the mass. So the mass, the mass is actually tricky. It's not. Okay, so no, 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 okay. It is up to a mass shift. Up to a mass shift, it's the same. Okay, so the mass shift is, is well, okay, sorry. Yes, yeah, but um, we will see that it's quite robust with respect to the, to, the, to the mass shift in the Wilson. Okay, so if I use the same mass, okay, yeah, okay. Okay. Oh, no, 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 of course. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. No, 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 that's true. I, I'll show the, I'll show, I think. Okay, I will explain. Okay, so, so when I, when I thought about the kernel operator, I thought about just the operator itself without the shift. So it's just, okay, so, okay. Maybe my, my wording was not consistent with the literature. So I, I, I just want to use the, the operator with, a, with another shift that was used to construct the, the Neuberger, okay? And what, I mean, okay, so basically this was the first point. This is what I motivated in the beginning. So we thought now is the time that we can say, well, solving Wilson is cheap. We have a solver to do that, so why not think about applications for, for this, okay? And I, I claim that it's cheap, scalable, and robust, kind of in the sense that Matthias just presented his results. And why does it make sense? So let's just assume for a minute and um, that our Wilson Dirac discretization would be normal. So normal in the mathematical sense. Uh, so let's just write it down. I'll, I'll come to it later on. So basically, the, one of the equivalent formulations of normality is just that d, d dagger d is equal to g d dagger. 
Okay. This is one of the, I don't know, I think 35 or more equivalent formulations of normality. Uh, it's actually one of the least interesting ones. Um, there are two more that I'm going to mention later on that are, my, in my mind, more interesting in this context. But this is one of them. So let's assume this is the case. If the operator is normal, actually one thing that you know is, of course, the other, one other equivalent formulation is that it's uh, orthogonally diagonalizable. So it has an eigen decomposition with orthonormal basis as eigenvectors. Okay, this is another equivalent formulation. And now because of this, so if your operator is normal, now you can get a relation between the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of your of the Wilson, the Dirac Wilson discretization, and the Neuberger that you just formulated based on this operator. It's straightforward. So now let's assume Lambda, okay, it might be a small or large eigenvalue, it doesn't matter. It's an eigenvalue of your Wilson operator. So you have an uh, associated eigenvector x with it, that, so that dwx is equal to lambda x. And now for now, just let's assume that this mass shift of our, of our resulting Neuberger overlap operator is zero. So this was just the mass shift that was added to whatever we did in here, to the non-trivial thing, just, then, just add the shift. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything in here. So the shift is no problem. So now let's just calculate this. So we know we can write this, uh, the sine function here as the inverse square root times the operator itself, the, the whole thing times x. And I'll just kind of pull the, pull the x through uh, and resolve everywhere where d, dw uh, hits a, is hit by an x uh, to, get, to get your lambda in here. And what you figure out is basically what you end up with is just uh, you have this, this kind of scaling thing here in front. And then 1 plus just the sine of lambda minus, the, minus the, the, the overlap shift times x. So basically for any eigenvalue lambda of your Wilson operator, you get an eigenvalue which is 1 plus the, this is now the complex sine of lambda minus m0 n uh, as an eigenvalue of your Neuburg operator. So now I have a comic showing you this, what, what's actually happening. So assume your Wilson is normal and all the eigenvalues are in this burger. It's just kind of a sketch, okay? So what did you do? You start with your Wilson. Now you apply this, this overlap shift, which moves your, your origin into the first hole. It doesn't have to be right in the middle. It can be left or right uh, of the middle. It just has to be somewhere in here in order to, to be reasonable. Now what happens if you, if you now calculate gamma 5 times the sine of gamma 5 times this? If you write it in terms of, uh, of the inverse square root, you basically see what happens is actually the, new, the eigenvalues of this operator are simply the eigenvalues of the original operator projected onto the unit circle along the line which goes through the origin. It's nothing else. If you just look at the calculation I did two slides ago, it's nothing else than that. Yes? Uh, well, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this year, I mean, this equation here only holds if the operator is normal. And of course, this picture, this projection here is only an exact projection if the operator is normal. But for now, let's assume this because this kind of motivates why it's a good precondition. So now we have all the eigenvalues. We project them onto the unit circle. So now they are all on this red circle, depending on where they are. And now you see also what basically happens to your operator. Basically, three-fourths of your operator are projected onto kind of the right half of your circle. And only one-third, basically, the ones which were important for the Wilson operator, because if you invert the Wilson operator, these are the dominant, uh, it's the dominant spectral part. Of course, they end up in the dominant part of your overlap operator as well. Yes, please. It's normal. I'll show you. No, okay. So one one case where DW is normal is the free case. I'll, if you don't believe me, this of course it is, right? Okay, and I, I'll, this is one of the one of the interest. I mean, to me, interesting and surprising. Uh, findings that I had when I thought about all the kind of, um, I mean, all of this, it comes in a minute, that it's actually, I think, quite reasonable to assume that your operator is at least not far from normal. Okay? 
And what, okay, the last step is just you shift basically the circle back and then now you have this mass that you want to have in your simulation basically as the, as the gap between the circle and the origin. Okay. So that's the, that's the Neuberger construction in a nutshell and let's assume that your operator was normal to begin with. Okay, so now um, kind of, I mean, I'm a numerical analysis or a mathematician, so I, I, I basically I seldomly just think about kind of the physics world, but I just think about linear algebra terms and uh, things that I understand. So just try to, I mean, try to get this in a mathematical context and understand what these operators actually are and, I mean, how can I make sense of them? And this might look, I mean, it's not, I mean, I don't have the physical intuition to, to do more than that. Okay. So let's, let's just think about the context that we're, that we're in. So basically you st start with an operator, with a continuous operator, which is chiral and gamma phi symmetric. So you have this, this, oh, this should be zero, no, this should be a plus and the zero or equal. This should be just an equal sign, sorry. Uh, it's correct here, it's not correct there. Okay, so you want to have that gamma 5D is equal to D gamma 5, and you want to have that it's gamma 5 symmetric, so gamma 5D and this whole thing conjugated is gamma 5D. And now let's basically, if you, if you just rewrite this, if you have these two, uh, these two properties, you can simply get rid of the gamma 5s in the chirality, and what you end up with is basically, if an operator is chiral, it just means that it's anti-Hermitian. I mean, it might be stupid because I'm losing the gamma 5, which is important for, for the physics, but in mathematical terms, this is how I think about chirality. It's just saying that it's anti-Hermitian. Now, why is this interesting? Because anti-Hermitian matrices are just normal matrices. I mean, it's kind of the, the normal matrices that occur in everyday life are Hermitian matrices, anti-Hermitian matrices, and non-trivial normal matrices. And mathematicians have thought about, and this is, this is where it comes to the different equivalent formulations of normality, have thought about kind of normal matrices and try to find different characterizations of normality which might help in certain uh, circumstances. And one of the other uh, equivalent formulations is that you can write the conjugate of the operator as a polynomial of the operator itself. Okay? Now this is actually, you can show that this only has solutions with the degree of P being uh, kind of, I mean, being one or, uh, I mean, either your operator has only a finite number of eigenvalues, then this is of course just the number of different eigenvalues, the degree of the polynomial, or it's one. Other cases do not exist. Anti-Hermitian matrices are of course just, I mean, one of the two examples where the degree of the polynomial is one because the polynomial is just minus t. This is what I write here. Now, if you take the degree of the polynomial, you call this matrix one normal. And actually, there is an interesting theorem, the, the faber manteuffel theorem, which tells you that if an operator is one normal or is actually s normal, then there exists an s plus two uh, recurrence Krylov subspace method. Okay, so it depends on the normality if you can actually write down a, a Krylov subspace method with short recurrence and it's directly defined how long your recurrence is based on this normal measure in the sense of the degree of the polynomial. And now you can ask yourself, well, now we have this famous Ginzburg-Wilson relation which, which tells you that you have retained some chirality on your lattice. And now you can do the same trick. Now, if you have an operator which is, fulfills the Ginzburg-Wilson relation and is gamma 5 symmetric, you can ask yourself, well, why don't I get rid of all the gamma 5s and try to write this as d dagger is equal to something. And now you end up with this formulation. Now you end up with minus d times 1 minus a times d inverse. And now there is another formulation of normality. Of course, there has to. Which says if you can write the conjugate of your operator as a polynomial in the operator divided by another polynomial in the operator, this is also a characterization of normality. If this is possible, your operator is normal. And then there is another theorem which states if your operator is now what's called 1-1 one, one normal, or I mean just degree of the nominator divided, uh, I mean, and degree of the denominator, actually there is another class of Krylov subspace method which fit also in this context. And this is basically 
kind of also in the context of overlap operators, we all know about the SUMR scheme, the shifted unitary matrix uh, minimal residual method. It's nothing else than exactly what you get out of this theorem, which basically states that if you have a 1-1 one, one normal matrix, you can get a 1-3 recurrence method. Now you have two nested recurrences but you can actually get a Kralov subspace method with short recurrence. So basically, this states directly that any operator which fulfills the Ginsberg-Wilson relation basically has to have a Kralov subspace method with short recurrence associate, associated with it. But what does this tell me? I mean, at least I thought, what does this tell me? Well, this tells me, of course, that any operator which fulfills a, uh, a kind of a remaining chiral symmetry on the lattice is normal, in a sense. Because what can I do? Basically, I can add other terms of higher order in D with higher orders in A, probably, uh, to this. So basically, I could, I think, you could basically just write down higher order formulations of the Ginsburg-Wilson relation. If you just add here, let's say, a, a term with A squared and three Ds in it, if you want to. I mean, I don't think that people want to do this, but you could, I guess. And then, of course, you would end up with uh, just a different normality. But I think that the kind of the thing that I thought is that why, I mean, I mean, what is exactly the difference bec between chirality and normality? And sort of also based on what, we, what I tried to motivate before is, I, I think there is not much of a difference in a sense. I mean, chirality is just a very special kind of normality that you want to have. And you are, but you seem to be happy with something which is not as strict. So somehow normality seemed to be the right thing to think about. And now they came, a different uh, thing which kind of led me to believe that this is the right thing to think about. Now you can ask yourself, you have your Derek Wilson discretization, you have a matrix, and you can ask yourself, what is the deviation of normality of this matrix? Now you know if the matrix is normal, now we go back to the first, uh, first definition, if the matrix would be normal, then D dagger D would be equal to D D dagger, right? Now you can ask yourself, what is the remainder? So what is D dagger D minus D D dagger? It's a matrix. You know that it has just connections of distance two. And now if you just write, write it down on three pages uh, of paper and just do the math, you figure out that if you now just take the Frobenius norm of, the, of, the DVA, of this difference, where the Frobenius norm is just uh, the sum over the squares of all entries and then the square root out of this, you see that the deviation from normality of your Wilson-Dirac operator is just 16 times the sum over all plaquettes, over the real of trace of all plaquettes, and now everybody in this room knows this is nothing else than just some, at least it's proportional to the, to the Dirac Wilson, uh, to the Wilson gauge action. Nothing else. And somehow I found this surprising, I don't know. Is this surprising? It's known, okay, good. Okay, it's known, I mean, good, that's, that's, huh? Okay, so it's not surprising. Good. Huh? No, I mean, okay, so it's not okay, so it's not surprising. That's good. No, it's good. Maybe it's trivial. Okay. So here comes the next connection, which we found, uh, we, which we found interesting. Maybe it's also just trivia. Of course, this is not a result of ourselves, but we found it. Which relates now, I mean, people have thought about using, using something which they call thick links or which they call smearing. And somehow, I always thought about this has a connection with normality. And now this is exactly the result that, that I want to show you, that smearing has an effect on the, on the deviation of normality and a very direct one. And you can easily see it via this, these two definitions. I mean, at least you can see it for, for stout smearing. For all the other smearings, it's just qualita qualitatively the same. It's, you can't really prove it. At least I, I couldn't. I couldn't, we couldn't find a proof. So if you look at the Wilson flow, hopefully everybody knows this. It's just uh, basically, um, well, it's a time dependent where this is some artificial time that you introduce, uh, gauge configuration. Uh, which fulfills this initial value problem where you have the Wilson gauge action in here and you take the derivative of the Wilson gauge action. So basically you take the negative gradient of the Wilson gauge action and you take as an initial values the original gauge field, uh, the gauge configuration. 
you define the Wilson flow, and you know, uh, maybe you know or maybe you don't, uh, you know about start smearing. So smearing techniques are always uh, kind of the question, can I change my gauge field, my link variables, uh, my gauge configuration in some way uh, that I have better properties? And this is just one way to change it in a way that I do not lose the SU3 uh, properties. So basically my change in uh, the gauge field is something which is, again, directly in SU3. I don't have to do any projections, any weird projections in the end. And I can write down the formulas for this. And now what you figure out is the following. So the Wilson flow you can show, or Lucia has shown this in, in a paper as far as I know, that uh, the solution is unique and is differentiable with respect to this time and the initial values. Um, the Wilson gauge action is monotonically decreasing as a function of tau. And one step of Lee Euler integration of this with a step length of epsilon gives you exactly Stout smearing. Okay, so the Wilson flow is just nothing as an infinit infinitesimal uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson flow. So basically this just means that if your epsilon is small enough, you can assume that Stout smearing improves your, I mean, basically reduces the gauge action and thus improves the normality. Okay, so what we are now assumed to see in the numerical results I'm going to show you is that the performance of our preconditioner depends or will be affected by smearing, for example. So we will see that the preconditioner should get better the more, or I mean, at least if I do smearing, we should expect that the preconditioner gets better. Okay, so now. Yes, sure. Of course, the continuum limit of every single discretization of yes. the Dirac operator is identical. Is, sorry? Is identical. Right. And therefore, and that's of course dominated by all the low eigenvalues, sure. right? and the continuum operator is normal. Sure. So any two operators that has the same continuum limit will be close to each other and will become a normal as you get the continuum limit, which is exactly what you get when you get smooth gauge configurations. Sure. So this is clear without any of the extra algebra you've done. Of course, it's, it's, it's clear. I, I thought it was still sort of interesting no, no, that you can I actually think, measure it. I mean. I'm not saying it's not interesting, but, but also chirality is not normality. Because if you add a mass to the uh, operator, it stays normal. If you take a normal operator and you add a constant, sure. it's normal, but sure. it's no longer chiral. Right, because so, it's I mean it's it's this so, this so, very special form of normality. This is exactly what I say. Chirality is a special. I mean it's exactly the the saying that your operator is one norm. It's anti Hermitian. That's it. Point. Right. Okay. Right. So, so it, it but it anti, is. I mean it's anti commuting with the gamma matrix. That's what it is. Gamma five. Well, yeah, which just means that you're, of course, well, of course, it's, I mean, I don't say that it's equivalent. I just say that once you base, I mean, okay. I mean, that hopefully that's all what I said, is that chirality is just a very special kind of normality. But, okay, maybe this is a wrong way to think about it. I think this is, mathematically speaking, this is not the wrong, uh, wrong statement, is all what I want to say. Right. Okay, another good point. But okay. Okay, so let's discuss this later on. I, I guess I'll, I still want to show some results. Or an anti operator plus a constant is exactly the situation. It stays normal. That's what the continuum operator is. The continuum sure. operator is yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. chiral. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the field theory we're trying to get. It's the continuum operator, which is sure. normal, but not chiral. No, just to be clear. No, say it again. I thought the, in the continuum limit, I want to have this exact special normality. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. But. Different because they need okay, no, no. I mean, I never claim that they are the same. I mean, of course they're not. I mean, I just, uh, basically what I said mathematically is chirality implies normality. 
Okay? This is true. And somehow thinking about what kind of the Ginsburg-Wilson relation tells me mathematically is that I might be happy with some sort of normality which turns into chirality in the continuum limit as long as I don't have a NAS. Okay? So I think that's the statement that I want to say. It's anti-hermeticity. No, it's a special case that we have anti-hermeticity. The gamified hermeticity is part of our formulation. Right. There okay. Sure. There are chiral theories which anti-gamified and are not gamified. Okay. Sure. Of course. They're not. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So I oversimplified everything, but still I can show you some results. No, no, it's true. I mean. Well, I, apparently, I, I mean, I mean, mathematically speaking, I did say something wrong. So that's it's it's a fact. Okay, but okay, let's. I mean, let's just look at what we could get for this special case of the Dirac-Wilson discretization in our setting uh, and the Neuberg operator formulated out of it. So this is kind of a sort of, I mean, realistic setting. Of course, it's just a four to the four configuration, so that we could calculate all the eigenvalues of the of the Wilson and all the eigenvalues of the overlap operator. It's not too hard to do. Uh, actually, you see the picture here much better than here. Uh, so you see that, well, I mean, you do, I mean, right? So, OK, the contrast is better. So basically, what you see is that you just have few eigenvalues here where, where it actually matters, and just few eigenvalues, both of the Wilson and the overlap. And actually, what you could also do, which, uh, I mean, we do not report and which we haven't really went back to look at, but what you can do is actually if you measure normality in a in a sort of spectral sense, so you take the eigenvectors and you just hit d gamma 5 d minus d d dagger, I mean d dagger d minus d d dagger, take the inner product of this, basically the Rayleigh quotient with the eigenvectors, what you figure out is that basically the eigenvectors close to zero are very normal in the, that sense. If you define this as a measure, the Rayleigh quotient of this uh, kind of difference here with the eigenvector as your measure of a spectral normality. You, you see that actually these vectors here seem to be the most normal ones. So for these, the relation actually holds very exactly the one that I've just shown you on the third slide. So basically, it's no wonder that the eigenvalues of your Wilson basically line up perfectly with these on the, on the, I mean, on the Neuberg overlap. Okay. So now, this is the precondition operator. Now this has these, uh, these eigenvalues. Am I already over time? No. Okay. Okay. Okay, so these are now the eigenvalues of the preconditioned system. So basically what you see is that all these eigenvalues here, of course this is now a non-normal operator, so things might screw up a little. I mean, things might jump around a little. But what you see is directly is these eigenvalues here, which are up to eight, are basically projected all onto here. So you would expect that kind of eight divided, I mean, two divided by eight gives you a quarter, and you exactly find this, this uh, kind of the mouth of your fish is exactly at a quarter. So these eigenvalues here correspond to these eigenvalues in the, pre in the preconditioned system. These here, I think, are some outliers which come from here and here. This here is exactly this, this boundary here, but which is nicely located kind of around one. And then you have some outliers, which I think come from here and here, but whatever. Okay. So which are the eigenvalues of the condition? The fish. The fish. Yes. The fish. And it's not a fishy result. It's actually a fish. Huh? Yes. The fish. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So some numerical results. So one thing that would that was noted is, of course, so typically if you have a Neuberger, I mean, a, a simulation with a Neuberger operator, the only thing that you can say is, well, you have some rough guess at this M0N, which is the shift where you have to put your Wilson operator at to actually be able to construct the Neuberger operator. This is some, but this is a very rough guess. It's typically accurate to about one order of magnitude. And then the other thing that you know is basically the shift of the Neuberger overlap operator from the origin. So you know the gap. So you know basically the gap of the circle. And you know roughly where the midpoint of this, of this hole is. But this, is, this doesn't have to be accurate and is not accurate. 
But in order to get a good precondition, of course, you might imagine that you have to shift the, the hamburger to a place which corresponds to the circle. And now the first, not, first results show you the dependence of the shift of the Wilson system with respect to the, uh, to the performance of the precondition. So let's look first at what, what, I'm going, what I show you is basically the whole method, which is just called FGMRES plus DD alpha AMG. So it's a flexible GMRES method to calculate for the calculation of the, of the outer iteration of your um, Neuberger overlap system with the DD alpha AMG preconditioner. And you see that if you choose your mass shift too large, so if you shift your Wilson operator too close to the origin, basically your cost, I mean, your time to solution goes through the roof. And this is mostly due to the fact that basically your Wilson system becomes too ill-conditioned, so you spend too much time calculating the precondition. But also note that the difference here also becomes larger, so the precondition is also not as efficient as before. But what you also see on the left-hand side is you do not need the, the mass shift very accurately, so you have some freedom to choose this as long as you do not overdo it. So in this part here, the, the solu time to solution for the Neuberger overlap system seems to be fairly stable, and also the time to solution for your preconditioner seems to be fairly stable. Noted here is, of course, due to the fact that you have to do, let's say, 30, 40, 50 iterations still of your Neuberger system, of course, the, the, the setup, which is costly of your preconditioner, you only have to do once. So actually, this is also an example where it pays off to do the setup once and then use the solver over and over. Okay, so this is um, this is solve time, which we are interested in. This is solver iterations, and here you see, of course, you have a speed, sweet spot. So there is actually a mass shift which is optimal, which you would expect. But of course, you have these two kind of uh, this, these two effects. So on this side, if you look at the solver iterations, your preconditioner gets cheaper, but basically the effect of the preconditioner is not as good. So it evens out, so you get a flat line here because this becomes more expensive, and you, but you do not need as many iterations, so these cancel out, so you get basically a flat line here. But in the end, they both get more expensive, so you do not have, I mean, you should not overdo this. And of course, the, the question is, how do you get a good guess at the shift for the Wilson operator? And we have some ideas uh, which are not part of the talk, but we, we are fairly confident that we can get this without, uh, I mean, fairly cheaply. It's not, it's not for free, but it's fairly cheap. So in the yes. Not, I mean, in, okay, so this is an example where we have uh, three, because this is actually a configuration out of a simulation, uh, 32 to the four lattice, uh, which is three times hex smeared. So the Wilson and Dirac operator is three times hex smeared, yes. And this is an overlap simulation, as far as I know, yes. Yes, please. No, no. This is basically on the far right side. If I, if I shift this so that both eigenvalues are basically the, the smallest eigenvalues of the Wilson are right on top of the smallest eigenvalues of the Neuberger, which is your idea, right? Yeah. This is not the best shift. This is basically, I think this is on this right-hand side of the scale. Well, I mean, this is what you see, right? I mean, if you... If, if, you have to be fairly close to this. I mean, you have to be near this to get a good performance, but you should not overdo it. I mean, you should not shift too far. That's kind of what these plots tell you. Of course, I mean, it's a, I mean the preconditioner does not depend only on one or two eigenvalues, especially if you look at this plot here. Kind of the small eigenvalues of this precondition system come to part from these, but they will be around one quarter anyways. And of course, you have these outliers, which might be something which comes from the from these sides, which is my guess. But that's that's not completely to be. I mean, this is not something you can prove. But it's kind of, of course, it's a it's a it's it's something you can play around with. But it's clear that just aiming for the smallest ones is not optimal, and it's not optimal because both it's not optimal as a preconditioner in the number of iterations of your Neuberger system, but it's also not optimal because your preconditioner gets too expensive. Um, oh, wait a second. So I'm not completely sure. Did I? Well, 
I know what you mean. Um, I'm not completely sure, though, if that's the case. I mean, in a sense, it is. Sure. We did this with the with the smallest eigenvalue of the of the Neuberger operator. I mean, we I I, sh I mean we can look at the it's results and see. Yes. That's sure, but I mean one thing that I probably did not say is of course this is the the part of this time spent in the preconditioner. But of course, if the out iterations grow, you would assume that at least because you do preconditioning in every iteration that this grows at least equally as much. So. Probably the scaling of one iteration of your preconditioner is not is not visible in here. Uh, what does it mean, Matthias? Um, that, <laughs> um, that, yeah, there's this, this, this average side in front of Oh yeah, it's an it's the average number of preconditioning iterations to reduce the uh, tolerance by two orders of magnitude uh, within the preconditioner. So this is the setting. So the overlap tolerance is 10 to the minus 8. The Wilson tolerance is 10 to the minus 2. OK, so one thing to note is that, of course, what I told you in the beginning is, typically, if you do not do preconditioning, you need 1,000 iterations. Now we're down to 50 iterations, if you do things correctly. OK, so now let's uh, study this effect that I just motivated, that typically, if you increase the smearing, you should see that your, your method gets better and better. And uh, fortunately, we could get exactly these results. So here we compare using just GMRES compared with FGMRES plus DD alpha AMG. And we see that GMRES benefits as well, I mean, benefits a little from increased normality or from smearing, whatever you want to call it. But our method uh, improves more. I mean, it gains more. And at the end, it's like a factor of, 100, close to 100, I guess. Whereas without smearing, we have a factor improvement of 5. Okay. And uh, what do we see here? Oh, also the number, I mean, the time that you spent in um, the consumed time, oh, per iteration of your Neuberger operator is, uh, I mean, what do we see exactly here? Um, For the for the unpreconditioned, but of course we need fewer iterations. Yeah, the unpreconditioned yeah. is pretty slow, yeah. but still there's also some some minor overhead. In the sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, but I mean, okay. So I had this. I mean, I I I mean, just because of the theoretical kind of motivation. We wanted to know if this is, I mean, kind of what effect does smearing have on the performance of the preconditioner? And so now here we just took a just took a configuration, an unsmeared configuration, and we, I mean, it's it's now no longer a simulation. It nothing to do with the simulation. We just took one configuration and we then smeared once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times with the same configuration. So now. Because, I mean, I think this is the only thing that might be comparable in, in any sense. Okay? And we see that we basically gain by, I mean, what we would expect, right? I mean, increased normality should increase the quality of the precondition, and exactly this is what we see here. The um, we don't have these these numbers in the slides, I, but I think we have them in the paper. Yeah, it's both. I mean, it's it's always a combined effect. It's not only the preconditioner that gets better. It's also that smearing does other things for you. That's true. So, um, in our experience, we use uh, 
on the CPU to standard inflation. And when we hit senior value values of H. Wilson, they actually become less dense, and which helps the Well, it's, it, it's due to another result, I think, we found by Lucier, which relates uh, normality or uh, the Wilson plaquette to, to properties of the eigenvalues of H. Wilson, which is basically you can get a lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue of H. Wilson based on the, uh, on, the, this, on the Wilson gauge action, or basically on the sum overall plaquette values. Or actually you can bound this, I think, by one, by the minimal, huh? I don't know exactly what it was. But basically, you, you can, what you can show is, I think I can draw a picture, and I don't know the numbers out of my head. But what you can show, and which is important for this HW, which is shifted if you have your burger, basically, you can, based on my definition of the measure of uh, deviation from normality, you can show that inside of some, uh, some kind of this box, there cannot be any eigenvalue if, I mean, kind of, if this measure is close enough to zero, there cannot be any eigenvalue in this box, and this is exactly what also dominates kind of the smallest eigenvalue of H Wilson. I think this is basically how it's derived, how this bound is derived. I can I can look up the paper if you like, if you want to see this. So yeah. Okay, so, so let's look at the at the other results that I have. I don't know what the time, uh, how I'm in uh, on schedule. So. What do we see here? So here we have a scaling with the overlap mass shift. So now we shift the overlap operator towards, uh, towards the imaginary axis and shift the Wilson preconditioner with it as well. So here we see that GM res uh, gets worse and worse in a sense how you would expect it because the, the condition number basically scales exactly with the smallest, I mean with the shift. So it should, be, should get worse and worse and almost uh, in this linear fashion as we see it here, and we see that our precondition does scale uh, better with respect to the shift. And what we also see is that basically what dominates it and which we would expect is that all the work that we have to do when making the system worse and worse conditioned is ending up in the preconditioner. Right? So the preconditioner gets more expensive the closer we get to the origin, but it's kind of co it's compensating for uh, for the, the difficulty that we have to solve the original system. Okay. And the same, I mean, this is, this is for solve time, this is for solver iterations. And now you see here, for the worst shift, we have now a comparison of 100 to over, or to, I don't know, 2,000 or something. So we have a speed up of a factor of 20. OK, so now here, another slide uh, towards the accuracy that you actually need in your preconditioner. So here you see that if you have kind of you need to have some accuracy, but it does not matter too much how much accuracy you have in the precondition. Of course, the precondition gets more expensive the, the more accurate you want to have the solution, but you do not see it kind of in the global convergence that much. So once you have reached 10 to the minus 1, kind of your preconditioner just adds to the cost. It does not really improve your result. Okay, this is again for the same configuration that we have. Okay, so now, I don't know, now I could stop either here or just tell a oh, few words. Just, uh, what we're going to do is we'll go another five or ten minutes, and then we'll have a coffee break for half an hour, and then we'll come back okay. to the last time, and I think we lost our open mics. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we lost that. Okay. Okay, so the, the one thing that we worked on, which, uh, which plays a role, is... Um, a different way of efficiently evaluating the inverse square root, uh, which uh, a PhD student of us, uh, of our group, uh, came up with. So basically, there are, uh, again, a few of equivalent ways of defining or writing down a matrix function. Yes, yeah, sure. Do you have a, a more analytic way to try and figure out um, uh, what mass you want to use for your Wilson preconditioner? Yes. Other than just doing the, did you show that? Did I miss no, it? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have to do it numerically every time. I mean, no, of course you don't. I mean, I think we have a very good kind of, kind of guess which ends up um, somewhere here. I mean, we, 
we cannot guarantee that we get kind of, I mean, of course, we cannot guarantee that you get right here, but I think we have a very good formula for getting you here, which is five, I mean, which is, okay. Yeah. And uh, basically, the only thing that you need is uh, some idea about the, the smallest eigenvalue of H Wilson, right? Or, I mean, you need some idea where the burger is. And once you know where the burger is, in some sense, you can kind of make sure that, basically, I think the best what worked is if you kind of place the, the, the mid, I mean, the mid of the circle on the mid of the Wilson and, um, I think, scale the Wilson a bit. And then take this value that you get as a shift and just add a secure, I mean, a safety measure and be done with it. There was no scaling anymore in it. Okay, but we think we have a we have found at least we have found a formula which worked for all the tests that we did, which basically brought us in this region. But you cannot guarantee anything. I mean, um, okay, good. So, um, so one of the uh, one of the more intricate uh, definitions of a matrix function is the following: you can actually represent your matrix function which for now will be just the inverse square root of a Hermitian positive definite matrix as uh, in the Cauchy integral representation where this is a contour. Uh, you have a weight function in here and then you have the, the um, uh, resolvent which is just T times identity minus A to the minus one and you integrate over, over your contour basically. And now what they figured out is that there is actually a stable way. So the, the interesting thing is, or let me, okay. So now what you want to do is basically uh, you want to use a Kraloff subspace method to evaluate your sine function or to evaluate your inverse square root. Now with, with uh, the problem with matrix functions is you never know how good your approximation is. I mean, how good do you know your, uh, your, your matrix function, it's a difficult thing to, know, uh, to, to calculate because, of course, the error you don't know. I mean, if you would know the error, then you would be done. And there is no sense of a residual, per se. There is no easy way to calculate a residual unless you are solving a linear system and your matrix function is A inverse. If you would know your residual, one thing that you, that you do all the time is restarting a Krylov subspace method, right? Do G, restart a GMRS. The, the, the typical example, you do 30 steps, then it gets too expensive. I calculate the residual, and I do an error correction. Now, what they figure out is that for, for a certain kind of functions, which are Stieltjes functions, you can do the same thing. You can do a restarted matrix function evaluation. And what you basically do is now your function changes. In every iteration, your function changes to the error function. Now, the interesting thing is if you use or if you do all this, what they did for the inverse, just the inverse, which is also a Stieltjes function, your error function is always, again, the inverse. So you don't have to change anything. It, it goes through magically. But now the thing is you can do this. So basically what you do is you do a certain number of Krylov subspace steps. So then you have a Krylov a Lanzos decomposition of this, uh, of your Hermitian positive definite matrix after k steps. And now you can calculate kind of your, your error of function based on numerical quadrature. You just use a, um, a Gaussian quadrature to, to approximate your error function, and now in this way, you can actually have a restarted function eva evaluation. And the nice thing about restarts is now you can also think about something like thick restarts, where you say, okay, in the first step, I can extract spectral information about the operator that I try to apply my function to. And now I can, instead of starting my Krylov subspace just from scratch, I can put in some information from the first cycle. Okay, this is what we then t call thick restarts. And this is basically the algorithm. So we calculate the Lanzos decomposition of our matrix. Typically, what you do then, I mean, in, in all the Krylov subspace methods for, function, uh, for matrix functions is you basically just apply your matrix function to the small matrix T, and then you lift it by, these, by your Krylov subspace base, basis. It's exactly the same thing you do here. So you calculate now your first approximation to your matrix function as exactly what you would do. So you take the initial residual, uh, which is just a multiple of the, f I mean, it's the, the first residual, you apply the matrix function to your uh, square part of your T matrix, you lift this to the whole space, 
And now what you do is you get an eigenvalue decomposition of this matrix. You extract the T smallest eigenvalues, you extend a new search space, uh, which is initially built up by this T smallest eigenvalues by, again, until it has size M. Now you compute the error based on, the, on your error function, which is defined by this, uh, by this numerical quadrature formula. And then you can update your approximation. And not only are you able now to do restarts and to do thick restarts, but you also have now some idea of how close you are to the solution because you actually have something like an error update. And now you can at least say if the error update is small, I might be close to the solution in a Cauchy sense. Okay? And actually, you can prove that for certain functions and certain matrices, actually, your, the norm of, these, uh, of what you get as an update here is monotonically decreasing. So you can actually prove something like the monotonic, dec uh, the monotonic convergence of CG or something like the monotonic convergence of GMRES. Okay? Good. And now the last comparison is just now we wanted, wanted to uh, accelerate our calculations further and we, have, we wanted to compare basically explicit deflation <coughs> with these uh, thick restarts, and this is what we see here now. Let's assume we want to deflate 100 eigenvalues in our uh, calculation. Then, of course, we have basically a fixed amount of time which goes into the calculation of the, eigen, uh, of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors that we want to deflate. Um, and now we see that, okay, so, so these are the methods. GMRES is just plain GMRES. Then we have GMRES R, which is just uh, um, um, mixed precision GMRES. And then we have um, FGMRES plus our preconditioner, and then we have the multi, uh, what is multi-precision preconditioned uh, GMRES R, where we actually have two layers of uh, of recursion, where we have a multi I mean, we have a mixed precision approach for the Neuberg operator, which is. I mean, basically, you have the Neuberg operator in double precision, preconditioned by the Neuberg operator in single precision, preconditioned by the by our multigrid method in single precision. Okay, so you have three layers of preconditioning, and what you see here is that basically um, explicit deflation, okay, has a has basically constant cost here. Um, I mean, has constant cost in the setup, and it gets cheaper, and it is for deflating 100 eigenvalues faster than the thick restarts, but the thick restarts seem to pay all, I mean, are at least kind of in the same ballpark. But of course, now, if you only think about solving one right-hand side, then of course, the thick restarts are uh, largely superior for our uh, kind of, for the method that we propose in the end, okay? Um, and the same goes, this is now, oh, this is smeared and this is no, not smeared. And well, I mean, the picture is similar, but, uh, Somehow here in, in the no, in the non-smeared case, somehow the, the explicit deflation seems to be performing even better compared to the thick restarts, but I mean we don't really have an explanation for that, I guess. Okay, so that's that's it, I guess. Um, questions. Questions? Any questions? In the um, in the sine function, just in terms of coding, um, it's it's H Wilson squared or whatever the kernel is that goes into the sine function. Do you ever you can optimize? You know, everybody writes an optimize D Wilson. Is there a way to optimize a D Wilson squared so that maybe when I you think people have done this. Function, At least I know of one conjugate gradient code, which I mean conjugate. I mean basically a CGNR code which has an optimized. Um, D dagger D, I mean DW dagger DW in it, which is equivalent to HW squared. Yeah. Do so there is, I mean, at least people have done this, I guess. Do you know off the top of your head if it's, I, I wouldn't think it's a factor of two, but. I don't I think, I mean, who looked at this? You, you looked at this code at some point, right? Either so you or you, I don't know who. Bjorn? I don't know. Or was it Otto? I don't know. Somebody, somebody was talking about this. So I, I, I don't know. It seemed to be faster than just doing kind of your stand, I mean, your optimized D implementation and then this twice. 
seem to be slower than the optimized D dagger D implementation, but I don't know the factor exactly, but it might be a factor of two. I there, there are, right, if you think of D dagger D, I mean, the issue is you save on, you construct a length two paths right. that appear, yeah. and you do all the matrix products in advance. And right. So there's a big overhead associated with doing all those distance two right. uh, operations, but then, uh, right, then it's just a single application of the operator. Right. But, but I, I don't know exactly what the factor is. Yeah, because, right, you're, yeah. well, I mean, a, no, when you're doing D and D dagger separately and you just have single link paths, there you have potential reuse that here you're, you're constructing all the con the basically, paths yes. in advance, you might actually not have the same reuse. Right. Well, I don't know, it depends on how, I don't know. Yeah. You've got to load all those paths into memory at some point. I think it's suicidal to do a single D dagger D Okay. Yeah, right. You're probably better doing exactly that. You have a single routine that does D dagger D. Like, I think that's what most people do anyways. But in, in it, it's it's doing D and D slash separately, but you're doing reuse of the gauge field. Okay. I think there was an era when people were trying to save on flops and the matrix products that you, you know, I've heard it said in certain regimes it could be I don't know. Yes. I can value is not being in that circle. I, it was too fast. Okay. What was your point there? Uh, so if I understand this paper correctly, um, about the lower bound, so what it was about was to get a lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue of the uh, Hermitian system, so of HW. And the argument was that if uh, whatever I showed you as a deviation, I mean, whatever, the sum overall, or was it just the smallest plaquette? I'm not completely sure it was this. It was the smallest plaquette? OK. So if you take the, the, of all the plaquettes that you have, the smaller, I mean, the one with the smallest real part of the trace of identity minus this plaquette, then you could guarantee that around the midpoint of this, of this hole that there are no eigenvalues in there. So now if you put kind of your con in your construction kind of the, Wils the, the Neuberger shift right in the middle, you basically can show out of the, the knowledge that in this, in this uh, region there is no eigenvalue of your D, that your H cannot have an eigenvalue which is basically of, of this, I mean of the size of sort of the diameter of this region. That, that freezes topology, which of course is... Exactly. Yes, of course. Exactly. You don't want to do that. Well, I mean, so on the other hand, because all, all reasonable discretizations uh, do have, I mean, have to have the, the right uh, continuum limit, this also means that if you get closer to the continuum limit, you cannot have topology change. Of course. Well, sure. Of course, you want, but well, well, okay. Good. Any other okay. questions? Let's uh, not lose our coffee break too. Right. Okay. <laughs> we'll be back at uh, four, I guess.
Um, before we get started, there's a proposal to, for dinner, uh, we could all meet at a restaurant which is closer, I guess, to the New Haven Hotel than to the Marriott. It's across from the Omni Hotel. It's called Prime 16. It's like uh, craft beers and fancy burgers and other stuff, too. Um, so uh, if I, I guess maybe not everybody's here, and so I'll ask this. Uh, maybe you can look it up, but not during the next talk. So I'll uh, at least write down the suggestion here. Uh, well, I'll call, I want to call and get a reservation. We might have to get a couple tables. There's somebody local here. <laughs> I've, I've been in there with uh, a group of 20. So I think we can get a reservation. OK, prime 16, and let's say uh, not too late, but not too early, maybe 6.30. Yeah, everybody can check in and do whatever. It's maybe for people from Europe, but it's not too late. OK, so after this talk, I will take a show of hands uh, to get a number for the reservation, and then I will call and make the reservation. OK, so our last talk of the day is Nigel, coming all the way from Korea. So he's probably feeling particularly jet lagged right now. Uh, and how great another talk on overlap. So I did a good job scheduling. Um, OK, take it away. Yes. Oh, this is working good. Thanks. It's about uh, 13 hours different. So um, I still think it's the middle of the night. So my apologies if I fall asleep midway through giving this talk. Um, OK, so this is a little more primitive than the uh, work we've been just discussing. And it's perhaps partly obs made obsolete by the previous talk, or even though that was discussing inversions rather than overlap fermions. This is work that I've been doing mainly in collaboration with a gra graduate student in So um, We also want to take a look at uh, multigrid methods, but uh, haven't yet thought about that too much, or I've thought about it, but haven't yet uh, tried anything. Um, so the overlap operator, we've had a couple of mentions of it so far today, including for our toolkits. Theoretically, it's the cleanest Dirac operator available in Lattice QCD. And for that reason, I think everybody should be using the overlap operator. On the other hand, it is also the most expensive operator available. It is algorithmically the more complicated than anything else. The metric sign function um, is particularly bad. And it's unlikely that the advantage advantages of exact color symmetry in the master's limit um, are worth this extra complexity. So other people would say that nobody should be using it. Um, I think, on the other hand, it's important to confirm any calculations using different methods. And basically, the theoretically clean part means that it would be good to confirm calculations uh, using the overlap operator. And there are some studies for which Carl participation theory cannot really compensate for the um, loss of Carl symmetry. And so various things here, there may be others. And there, so there may be some studies which are easier or more accurate of overlap fermions um, than other discretizations. Obviously, you can use domain rule or some similar one to get a uh, lot of goods. So I think reducing the cost of overlap fermions is still an interesting area to study. Um, the, I've written down the overlap operator here. It's a slightly different formulation than uh, in the previous talk, but uh, the same basic idea. The main problem is um, the gamma 5 sign of this kernel operator. You can say gamma 5 times the Wilson operator minus some mass. Uh, mu here represents a mass parameter. It's basically proportional to the quark mass, the quark mass. And as I mentioned, this has a lot of theoretical advantages, mostly associated with an exact color symmetry in the massless limit. I don't really want to discuss those here. But. So the big question is, how do we approximate this metric sign function? And there are five approaches that I know of. First of all, there's the spectral decomposition, which obviously is exact, but um, impractical after a certain point. 
Uh, first, land trust approach. We heard a, another mention of a land trust approach. This was also proposed by Artem Barisi a number of years ago. Um, I'm not sure how many people use it. Then uh, the three main approaches used are the polynomial approximation, such as Chebyshev polynomials, the rational approximation, and also a five-dimensional representation. If you just use, say, a five-dimensional representation, then obviously you've got basic domain wall fermions with a different kernel operator. Um, and in practice, say, the rational approximation is equivalent to that. So if you just did a solar tariff approximation without any precondition, and that's equivalent to the optimal domain wall fermions that uh, Tiro Chow uses. Um, the main difference, I think, between overlap fermions and domain rule is that in overlap fermions, we use a partial deflation to get the low eigenvalue part of the metric sum function exact. In domain rule, fermions you don't do that, so you've got a tanch function, which is bad around your zero eigenvalues, or a sort of tariff approximation, which is bad around zero eigenvalue. For overlap fermions, we use a partial deflation, a spectral decomposition, run that to a zero eigenvalue, and we get the sum function exact there. And so I think that is really the most important difference between um, overlap and domain rule fermions. Um, the rational approximation generally requires fewer calls to the kernel operator. The polynomial approximation, on the other hand, requires less junk apart from the Wilson operator. Which one is faster depends on which uh, system you're using. You have to check it. But the key thing is, in most of these methods, it is much, much cheaper. Um, maybe you can get a factor of 10, maybe even more, to use a low accuracy approximation of the metric sign function from a high accuracy approximation. Um, and obviously, you can get even more of that because you only need to calculate in single position for a low accuracy approximation to the sign function. So the goal in designing any method for overlap fermions is, can I use a low accuracy Dirac operator to do the bulk of the work? Um, which is just what I've said here. So for inversions, we figured out how to do this some time ago. Um, we can start with a high accuracy overlap operator and gradually reduce the accuracy as we you generate the Kulev subspace. Uh, and the second thing is to use a low accuracy inversion as a precondition for a high accuracy inversion. Yes. Well, the idea is a low accuracy approximation to the metric sign function obviously breaks the Carl symmetry. Um, it's not good, but it's still for a numerical method if you're using it as a preconditioner, for example. Our, our aim is to get out the result of a high accuracy metric sign function, but we want to do that by applying a low accuracy um, approximation to the overlap operator. So our final inversion the residual is calculated with the high accuracy metric sum function, and that should be pretty good. But we can get that by mostly using a low accuracy approximation to the sum function. For example, the easiest way to think about it is use a low accuracy inversion as a preconditioner for your high accuracy inversion. Um, so in total, combining these two methods, we get about a factor of five or six over the naive inversion, which is obviously nothing compared to what multi-group people are getting these days. But currently, I don't know that there's any. Most of the multi-group methods I've seen require an ultra-local action to be reasonably efficient, and that's not possible with overlap fermions. Um, obviously, there's the approach of using the Wilson operator as a preconditioner. And that we'll have to look into. That was getting about a factor of 20, I think, or 30, more than this. So this gives you, this plot here gives you some idea of the work for inversions. So this is a relaxed CG, for example, this uh, purple curve. And then if you, if you didn't include relaxation, it should just continue down here, so you get over here somewhere. The x-axis, the number of calls to the Wilson operator, which I'm using to basically hide how inefficient my code is, which you would see if I have computed some against the residual of the inversion. Um, so for re relaxation, 
bends this curve around here, we use a very low accuracy uh, metric sign function down here, which means that it becomes faster each time. The green curve here is a shifted unitary minimal residual, which is an optimal self for the overlap operator, which, as we just heard, is a shifted unitary operator. And then if we apply the GMSR um, preconditioning that I mentioned before, then we get these two curves down here. So you can see there's a big gain by using GMSR preconditioning and an even bigger gain over the unrelaxed version. So the key thing is here, each of these little peaks here is another restart of the um, outer inversion for the preconditioner. Um, and Suma, if you're just interested in a single, say, propagator inversion, then Suma is about a factor of two. Not quite a factor of two, but nearly a factor of two better than CG. Um, so that's inversion, which we dealt with some time ago. But what's about the eigenvalues? Um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be used in calculated statisticity um, calculations. You can use them to deflate the inversion, for example. Here you only need a very low accuracy eigenvector. Once again, this is a little bit obsolete with multi-grid methods. Um, you can also use them to, in, say, low mode averaging uh, for certain observables. It can be very efficient in reducing your error in your measurement on the configuration. And there are certain observables which can directly take from the eigenvalues and eigenvectors um, the car constant and QCD vacuum. And one thing I've found while trying to do overlap simulations is, although the inversion part is working well, when you want to calculate something, you need a lot of inversions. It is very useful to deflate or to use one of these uh, low-mode averaging techniques. So having the eigenvectors is useful, but it is very expensive. Um, it's going to be particularly bad, obviously, when you go to a um, large volume, or if you used a mixed action approach, then the eigenvalue spectrum obviously becomes worse, and it's much harder to calculate them. Um, I'll just say the overlap operator, it shifted unitary, as we just heard, so it's normal, at least if you calculate the sine function to a high enough accuracy. Um, that means that um, all the good effects, you've got the orthogonal eigenvalues, you've got the left and right eigenvectors are the same. Orthogonal eigenvectors, it's generally speaking much easier than, say, a Wilson operator, which isn't normal. Um, the eigenvalues line a circumcomplex plane. You've got real eigenvalues at uh, 0 and 1 using, sorry, 0 and 1, not plus minus 1. Um, other eigenvalues come in complex conjugate pairs um, given here. And in particular, these pairs of eigenvectors are related to each other either by multiplying by gamma phi or multiplying by the sine function. You can map from one of the eigenvectors in this pair to the other. So, in principle, you can construct the eigenvectors from just about any non-trivial function of gamma phi and v sine, as long as they're not degenerate, non-zero modes aren't degenerate. Um, I should also say this red emission overlap operator has degenerate non-zero eigenvalues, which can make life a bit trickier. Um, and I should also mention the eigenvectors of the Dirac operator and the emission form of Dirac operator are independent of the quark mass. Again, for Wilson fermions, for example, this isn't the case, but for overlap fermions, they are independent of quark mass. So you can calculate them once on your configuration, and then no matter what mass you want to put in, you have the same eigenvectors. Um, so deflation is a way to construct a precondition or start a guess for the inversion using the eigenvectors. We're all probably familiar with it. So the condition number of the operator improves by the ratio of the uh, smallest and largest eigenvalues calculated. Um, can get about a factor of five gain. Obviously, multi-grid methods, it's slightly old technology. Multi-grid methods are generally better, but they're not available for overlap fermions. Um, but still can be useful in some circumstances. Obviously, it becomes less effective when you go to a larger lattice. You need to calculate more eigenvalues. Um, also, mixed action approaches tend to be worse. The eigenvalue spectrum tends to be worse. Um, so the problem becomes harder. Um, I'm generally speaking working on fairly small lattices, though, so that's 
not so much of an issue. So the standard method is the uh, use of Gallican projector, and this is basically equivalent to the Gallican approach. Construct an initial guess from the eigenvectors of A. Um, choose this parameter here. Uh, for example, I've used it to minimize the residual, which you can then calculate it. And this method accelerates the inversion until it, the inversion residual becomes similar to the eigenvector residual. And after that, the inversion proceeds at the antiflated rate. Um, in our case, we're going to deflate the low accuracy preconditioner. So if you've got this plot here, this is the residual against the number of iterations for the um, overlap operator. This is the, without deflation, the gray curve and the blue curve shows it with deflation. So you can see a nice gain up to this point here, which is about the accuracy to which I calculated the eigen values and then it breaks off. And by the end of it, it really doesn't look like you've gained anything at all. But if you cut off the inversion here, in this case, I'm using a fairly large mass, prime mass, you get about a factor of two gain in here. So we input this low accuracy self with deflation works well as a preconditioner of the high accuracy self. Now the second method, which is actually, it's not very good if you're not using overlap fermions, but it works, I think, very well for overlap fermions. So if you want to invert this where A is, say, emission and positive definite, you can explicitly construct a preconditioner from the eigenvalues. So all this preconditioning does is it projects the small eigenvalues up to some parameter C. For you say your Wilson fermion, this, the cost of constructing this precondition is going to be too much, but for overlap fermions, nothing is going to be significant compared to the metric sine function. So this is pretty effective. Um, it doesn't slow down. This method doesn't slow down, as we saw before. It is generally more efficient than um, using the Galakin projector. Um, it, it only really works, you can't use this for the shifted uh, unitary minimal residual because you break the unitary structure. Um, but for CG, this works pretty well. And this method tends to be better as use, used for a, a deflation. OK, so that's talking about inversions for the first part of the talk. My main topic, of course, is eigenvalue routines. And I'm going to consider four different eigenvalue routines uh, for overlap fermions. Um, I'll look at ArgSuma, which is basically equivalent to the ArgCG, which was popularized a few years ago just using the Suma inverter rather than the CGU inverter. Um, I'll look at the unitary land trust, which is basically the um, land trust method or analogy method you can build out of the uh, SUMA subspace um, and discuss a couple of other things, Jacoby Davidson and uh, something else, I'll talk about this briefly. Unfortunately, I was hoping our results would be in for these two, but then not quite yet. We haven't quite finished optimizing those two, so I can't give you final results there. So the SUMA routine is a way of constructing finality basis with short recurrences. It was mentioned in the previous talk. I've given the actual algorithm down here. So we're generating Q. It's a little bit more complicated than, say, a land trust routine, but not by much. Um, so it generates a set of orthogonal vectors Q, which you can then combine into a minimal residual inversion routine, if you like. Or if you're just interested in an eigenvalue approach, then obviously this would be the basis of your Arnoldi or land trust method. The recurrence can be used for a minimal residual inversion routine. The question is, what accuracy do we need to calculate the metric sign function contained within this U operator at each step of the generation of a creative subspace? Um, for inversions, this is reasonably well known. Uh, we've got this equation here. So this is the exact residual. This is the residual we com uh, compute. And then we've got the, what's known as the residual gap, which is the difference here. And we need to keep this residual gap so that it is smaller for now accuracy, so this doesn't. This thing here comes from having a low accuracy metric sign function, effectively. And the optimal result for a minimal residual algorithm is that your accuracy for the sign function is basically inversely proportional to the residual that you've calculated. So you start off with a low residual, so this is um, 
so you start with a high residual surface is a fairly small number you need a very accurate sun function and eventually it tapers up to virtually nothing um, you need to put in a cutoff if you go below a certain accuracy it breaks down but uh, for the most part here now if you want to calculate the eigenvalues as well we can just add a few things into the um, sumer algorithm we just basically collect together the um, Dirac operator times these uh, shifts, which we can do obviously without applying the Dirac operator again. We collect these into a vector. We, uh, we collect these into a subspace. Once it becomes as big as we can store, we diagonalize that subspace. I use this operator here. I discussed this in a little while. So this is basically diagonalizing not by the square root overlap operator to remove it to generacy, so I've shifted it by a small amount. And then we just continue generating our subspace. Um, and for the diagonalization as against this is basically going to be a thick restart uh, method. It's exactly the same as the ArcCG method, just using the Sumer um, iteration instead of CG. So to remove the degeneracies for the non zero eigenvalues, we add this thing here, gives us the D dagger D in here, Vz is the Dirac operator times the vector, and then I add something proportional to D, or gamma 5D, and this just shifts the degeneracy, so removes the degeneracy eigenvalues. Um, obviously, you could combine this routine with an inverter, and that gives something they call Ixuma. Um or we can run it as a standalone eigenvalue solver, and I call that unitary natural. Um, and if we're using this side soon, we can start inflating as soon as the eigenvalues are good enough. Um, for diagonalization routine, I just put something in here for notation, which I'm going to use later. First of all, I use an LDU decomposition to often normalize the vectors. And secondly, you can then use diagonalization routine. So V, uh, sorry, U here is my, um, used in my often normalization and V is the matrix of the eigenvalues. Um, it's useful to separate the re-diagonalize each non-zero, that's basically a technical detail. Um, now, in principle, we don't need any additional calls to the overlap operator beyond the generation of the creed of the subspace. In practice, it is somewhat different. If our VD, which is meant to be the Dirac operator times the uh, Q vector. Um, if this becomes too inaccurate, then the whole eigenvalue calculation can disintegrate. So the question is, how accurate do we need this for the eigenvalue calculation to remain stable? Um, we're using an approximate matrix sign function. I'll call that S tilde, with S being the exact sign function, an approximate Dirac operator D tilde, and approximate uh, VD, which is V tilde. And we can write that V tilde will be V plus some error. And our goal is to keep this error sufficiently small that it doesn't affect our final result. Um, it does affect residual. Residual for an eigenvalue calculation is basically the um, square root of the I proposed eigenvectors sandwiched between it, or the square root of the operator sandwiched between the proposed eigenvector minus the uh, single eigenvector square root. So I think I can finally square it here. Um, and so if you forget about rounding errors and so on, our residual is going to be the true residual plus some error here, which is proportional to delta. Uh, so if you square this up, you can calculate the residual gap is this thing here. Um, so the residual gap is going to be given by the um, RV squared, which is basically this thing here projected out, minus our true residual squared. Um, so, if, um, so if we want to keep this residual gap smaller than epsilon squared, it's basically residual gap is given by this, where epsilon is which size accuracy of the eigenvector. So that means that we need to keep um, this G smaller than this, which needs to be smaller than our tolerance. So from this we can derive how small we want the normal of this delta to calculate it. And what you find is that this does not relax anything like as much as the inversion did. 
um, this stays at roughly the same tolerance as our epsilon squared. So when our residual starts dropping down to zero, this means that we need the accuracy that we want for the eigenvectors all the time. If our residual is larger than zero, then obviously this might uh, decrease. But uh, um, in other words, during each update, sorry, just complete this argument and I'll discuss that. During each update of the eigenvectors, we know that BD, we've got these V and G matrices we used at the update, um, goes like this, where this delta is either coming from the previous L and an eigenvector or due to the application of D in the similar routine. So we can calculate the new delta I as the sum over these components here. It's given by this bound here. So what this means is the rigorous bound for the matrix sign function means that we have got to calculate to each point the matrix sign function to this accuracy. K is the number of times before we essentially we, we, we call the matrix sign function number of steps before we starting we calculate the eigenvectors. Um, we use this as the residual of the best converged eigenvector. There's also we need this norm of UV. We can estimate that from previous iterations. This bound is actually more conservative than we need. Um, this assumes that the errors all add together. In practice, they're not going to. So in practice, we can use, after the first few diagonalizations, where we have to use the residual bound, after the first few restarts, we can just take this term here and turn it to a square root, assuming the errors possibly cancel each other out. Um, but even so, this bound is of the order of the accuracy we need for the eigenvectors. This means that during a analogy calculation of the eigenvectors, um, we can't relax the overlap operator. Uh, we can, of course, start by trying to calculate some eigenvectors to a low accuracy, and then gradually then recalculate them. That doesn't tend to help much in practice. The um, eigenvectors converge at different rates, and your eigenvectors closest to, closest to zero tend to converge rather quickly. Um, well, the other ones are fairly slow. Um, also, the Q vectors can quickly lose orthogonality when the overlap operator is calculated to a low accuracy um, if you're using a sumer. And if they are not orthogonal, we need to perform some projections. We need to perform a gram of orthogonalization, um, which means that once again we can quickly lose accuracy on here if there are near duplicate eigenvectors. So we also need to continually recheck the accuracy of this VD and recalculate it if it becomes too bad. So I'll just show you a few plots now. This shows you the gain I've got from interpolation. These are a fairly small lattice and a large Krug mass, so the gain is not as large as you would see in a real-world simulation, but uh, I'm restricted by the computer power available to this sort of uh, lattice size. So these are the two curves I showed you on the previous plot. And you can see I've got about a factor of two, I think 2.3 for SUMA, and it's about 2.7 was the factor for, um, for CG. In fact, so the red curve and purple curve are CG, the black curve and the blue curve are SUMA. Once again, the course to course and operator using to measure how costly this is. Um, the CG is pretty much exactly improved, so it's pretty much exactly the rate you'd expect from the improvements in the condition number. Um, when we calculate the eigenvalues, I've got here the, looking at the sumo routine, I've got here the black and blue curves from the previous slide here. And calculating the eigenvectors, this is the first one that I did, and I had to reset the eigenvectors each time here. And then gradually it gets better, but it is still much slower, as you can see, than the original and the deflated inversion, simply because the cost of having to keep the high accuracy overlap operator over time just makes it so slow. In terms of the iteration count, um, the number of calls to the overlap operator, uh, you can see it gradually improves. Um, this is again one, this is three. 
after three calls to axiom, if this is after five calls to axiom, and that's basically what you get from a full accuracy set of eigenvectors. Um, so again, there's an improvement factor of about 2.3 in the iteration counts here. For CG, um, I've got a similar plot here. Firstly, to show that the improvement is slightly better in terms of the number of iterations. Um, but secondly, we've got here after just three steps of CG, you can get away with much smaller accuracy eigenvectors to get full deflation from CG than um, in SUMA. So here I needed five eigenCGs to get the full effect. Here I only needed, well, it was practically there after the second eigenCG. The third one is not getting us anything. Um, this is talking, uh, discussing the relaxed, so the accuracy. So this is just to see if my relaxation bound is working. So this purple curve is the target accuracy I wanted for the eigenvectors, and this red curve is the actual accuracy I had with this bound. I, it jumps around a lot. This is because I started off trying to calculate the eigenvalues to a fairly low position, then when I restarted, I reset the accuracy. I'm trying to calculate the eigenvectors. Each of these jumps is one of these restarts here. And I just used a straight Lanchos routine to get this out. So if we look at the iteration count against the eigenvalue residual, um, we can see that the relaxed and the full accuracy, there's not much difference in terms of the iteration count. In terms of the number of calls to the kernel operator over time, the relaxation initially at least gets a gain. However, you'll note that after a certain period, after so this curve is the, I think for 29th or 30th eigenvalue, this is the first eigenvalue. And you'll notice that after a certain while, the axioma routine just doesn't help converge the eigenvalue. It really slows down a lot. It's good to get some low accuracy, the eigenvalue starts with low accuracy. But after a certain number of iterations, after about 50 iterations or maybe 100 iterations, there's really very little improvements in the convergence. Of the, um, so this led me to want to look at some other eigenvalue routines apart from just the Arnaldi or the CG would be similar. So the obvious thing to look at is the Jacobi-Davidson routine which is basically a generalization of inverse iteration. Um, I've put the details here. Maybe I will skip through the details quickly. The basic idea is that um, by inverting this operator, A minus lambda, projected into a subspace orthogonal to your eigenvectors, um, you can create another vector S, which is more or less the correction between the eigenvector you want, of the current eigenvector, guess of the eigenvector you have, and your preferred eigenvector. So U star is the exact eigenvector. This is your current guess. S is the correction. And if you neglect terms of order S squared, then S is given by this relation here. You can show that. So this is effectively newton raphson method with neglecting terms of quadratic. And it converges usually within about four or five iterations, but you do need an accurate guess of the eigenvalue before you start. So you stick in here, and you need an accurate guess of the eigenvectors before you start, or a good enough guess of the eigenvectors for deflation of this operator here. So, One question. yes. Does it help to keep the next term in S in terms of the accuracy you need for the... Oh, well, that's... You mean keep the previous S that you've been... Oh, you're saying you're neglecting terms of order S squared. Oh, no, it's just keeping the next term in S. Well, we're, by, we're basically removing this term here. Right. The reason we remove this term is we don't know what this difference is. Right. Lambda primes is the guess we've got. Lambda star is what we want. This is basically a term of order S squared, and it's this term here that I'm killing to get here. The main reason we neglect this is because we don't know what this is. So um, it would be good if you knew what it was, but since we don't, 
Um, you can probably generalize it and have a higher order calculate approximation, um, such as for more generalizations to Newton Newton's methods, which uh, use higher order. Okay. But but it'd be more complicated. This is, I think, the standard approach, and this works pretty well anyway. Um, so you can construct an orthonormal basis of vectors. Um, basically constructing it from your eigenvectors and these S's, you can diagonalize that basis and then you will find um, a more accurate guess of the eigenvectors. And you can repeat this until you have an accurate estimate of the eigenvector. So it's not very good for low accuracy eigenvector calculations because you need a good guess of the eigenvalue before you start. And I use deflation, um, so you need a good guess of the eigenvectors so your deflation works. Otherwise, this inversion is just too expensive. So it's not very good for the low accuracy, getting low accuracy eigenvectors from just some random starting vector. But if you've got some low accuracy eigenvectors, then this converges very quickly. And so I should say, because most of the work is done in the inversion, for overlap fermions, obviously, we know how to do an inversion reasonably efficiently. Um, so we can calculate more low accuracy eigenvectors than we need to build up a preconditioner. For degenerate eigenvalues, we need to expand the uh, projector of our current estimate. Um, also, the non-zero eigenvectors come in pairs, as I mentioned. So you just need to get one half of those eigenvectors out, and then you've got the other half automatically. Um, generally speaking, needs about three to four inversions per eigenvector um, if we start from actually for around 10 to the minus 3. So it works well if we have a small number of, or if we want a small number of eigenvectors calculated to um, risk proposition, if we've got a good initial guess. So you can, yes. Um, you can check if they come in pairs, for example. Um, the eigenvalue should come in pairs. So you've got your zero modes, and then you've got your non-zero modes, which come in pairs of opposite chirality. Um, secondly, you can look at the chirality. Zero modes are of exact chirality, but non-zero modes are not of exact chirality. So obviously, if you if it's a bad accu uh, accuracy, then none of these work, because you're not certain if you've got all the pairs and so on. But once the accuracy is good enough, then you can distinguish the zero modes and the non-zero modes by looking at the chirality, or looking at if they come in pairs, and so on. Um, so you can see what I want to do here. I want to use Arxuma of the analogy method to get up the eigenvectors to a low accuracy, and then plug them into, say, Jacoby Davidson to get them out to a high accuracy. Um, there's another routine I've been playing around with here, which I'm calling sort of tower of eigenvectors. So the basic idea is to create a vector which is the sum of our best guesses of the eigenvectors. We can then apply a step function which basically projects out all the parts of the errors that we don't want. And then we try to reconstruct the eigenvectors from this B vector using, say, a Lantros procedure. So in principle, if you've got the sum of the eigenvectors and you apply, or sum of n eigenvectors and you apply in order n Lantros, and you just get up those eigenvectors again. Um, so in principle, this just uses one set of inversions to generate this um, projector of, to calculate as many eigenvalues as we want, whereas Jacoby Davidson needed inversions for every eigenvalue. In practice, of course, it doesn't work as smoothly as this. The first problem is that um, when we try to reconstruct the eigenvectors from this B primes, we run into fairly huge problems. Um, so if we write B prime as the sum of the eigenvectors plus some error delta, um, then we can apply some function of the operator A to B prime and another function of the operator A to B prime uh, to get a second component of this matrix here, and so on. We then subtract the same thing as in for our error, and then it should give us the um, eigenvectors times some other matrix here which depends on the same functions acting on the eigenvalues. And I'll write this in a simpler form. B minus delta equals psi, the size of the vector of eigenvectors. B is the uh, matrix of these things, and uh, 
lambda is this matrix over here. Um, so I'm going to treat these as arbitrary polynomial functions of our operator. In principle, we don't, of course, know delta. Um, we don't know what this is. In principle, we just want to invert this lambda onto here. The problem is this lambda, if you do this badly, contains a number of very small eigenvalues. So the inversion lambda, delta lambda to minus 1 can blow up if you've got some very small eigenvalues. So you need to tune these polynomials pretty carefully to make sure that uh, this uh, delta lambda to minus 1 stays relatively small. But this can be done. Um, we also know approximately what the leading contributions to delta are. They're the eigenvectors which we haven't got. We, the next eigenvectors to the ones we want, which we can calculate. We know what these lambda matrix is because we've always got a rough guess to the eigenvalues. So we can do this tuning here just using a small system. We know what the eigenvalues are. We know, roughly speaking, what, um, what dominates this delta, what dominates this lambda. So we can perform this tuning without actually having to apply the overlap operator. And it's relatively fast. So I'm going to choose these f to be a function, basically a polynomial function with various coefficients c. And we're going to find through the coefficients, see the order of the polynomial, just to minimize. So I've chosen this somewhat arbitrarily. It keeps delta lambda to the minus 1 below 1. This is minimized when it's about 0.5. And then we want the smallest order of polynomial to do that. So this is just some crude measure to keep this thing good. Then we can use these functions to effect, efficiently extract the eigenvectors from to be primed. Um, I actually use this operator instead of the overlap operator, which works in just one Carl sector, so there are no degeneracies. And secondly, it means that the eigenvalues we want are 1, and the, the eigenvalues close to 0 for the Dirac operator are 1 for this operator, and the eigenvalues close to 1 for the Dirac operator are 0 for this operator. So I've just basically 1 minus the Dirac operator projected into Carl sector. And then we can construct the other one. So, in other words, lambda star here. We make lambda star about the smallest eigenvalue we want to calculate, or so equivalent to the eigenvalue we last eigenvalue we want to calculate. And this will suppress all the other eigenvalues, the large eigenvalues, and enhance the ones we want to calculate. There's some difficulties, most which are I haven't yet fully resolved. They're mostly associated with rounding errors, limiting both the accuracy of the eigenvectors we can achieve, and also this thing here. I'm having difficulties inverting this matrix because of rounding errors. The scale tends to be about some elements of this about 1, other elements about 10 to the 16 um, on the simulations I'm using. That becomes difficult um, unless you use some more sophisticated um, mix. Um, Facial point accuracy. Um, so at the moment, I'm limited to doing about 10 vectors at a time, or calculating about 10 eigenvectors at a time, which sort of messes up the point. So I'm still working on that. This metric sign function can be approximated to low but good enough accuracy by Zero Tariff Rex no approximation, which is why I've called for Tariff. Um, we can use a multi shift solver for larger shifts and then switch to a preconditioned, which the larger shifts tend to be above 1 or order 10, um, so they converge very quickly in a, even without preconditioning. Then you can switch to a deflated preconditioning ICG inversion for the smaller shifts of this inverter, and that seems to be reasonably efficient. The point is we require fewer inversions than the number of eigenvalues calculated each time. At least if you did it properly, you would require fewer inversions. So in principle, this should beat Jacoby Davidson to get the eigenvalues out to a moderate accuracy. And if necessary, you can use a Jacoby Davidson to polish them if they haven't quite come out of the required accuracy. So unfortunately, my results here, I've only got the smallest set in. I was hoping to have a few more in by the time I'm giving this talk. But we can see Jacoby Davidson is, well, the analogy just didn't converge to the required accuracy. 
Um, I can't get the eigenvectors out of an NOD to require accuracy within a reasonable amount of computer time. Jacoby Davidson requires about uh, 40 million calls to Wilson operator to get these 20 eigenvalues out to require accuracy. The Zoro tariff was a little bit worse. In practice, for the total time, the Jacoby Davidson requires a lot of diagonization of these small matrices, which can't be efficiently parallelized. So there's the additional costs for Jacoby Davidson are larger than they are for this routine. Um, and secondly, I should say the solar tariff number, it's not using the best routine. So in particular, both of these numbers can be improved just by coding it more efficiently. Um, so this is not a final result. Um, so just to conclude, we've calculated bounds for the accuracy of the overlap operator required by an OD method. And it requires a high accuracy metric sign function, and it can't get out of the eigenvectors to a good accuracy within a relatively short time period. Um, the Jacobi Davidson and Zoro Tariff routines can calculate eigenvectors to a high accuracy reasonably quickly. Currently, the Jacobi Davidson routine is winning slightly. I'm hoping that by the time I've finished, the Zoro Tariff is going to win, but currently, Jacoby Davidson, which is the most standard approach, is winning. Um, but they're of a similar cost. Um, there's not much difference between the two. We've still got quite a few optimizations we can make, especially for Zoro Tariff. Um, it seems to be particularly sensitive to focusing point errors, and that's the main problem we need to resolve. Um, OK. So. Okay, uh, any questions? Oh. Oh. I'm not clear at all. Yeah, I don't. Well, 40,000. Uh, okay. <laughs> right, 40, 40 million uh, calls to the Wilson. Yes, this is. To get 20 items. I know. It, it's. <laughs> But the previous methods I was using were even worse. Yeah. This is just bad. And of course, this is a small lattice. Mm -hmm. um, on the larger lattice, it is going to be scale even worse. Um, I mean, this is it's this sort of number. And I said it was even worse before when I was using other methods, which really got me to look into this problem, because it's, it's proving to be it's, I won't say it's the bottleneck because you've got to perform so many inversions. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you perform, um, I mean, how many inversions did uh, Benin say this morning on the reasonable configuration? It's um, 70,000, 80,000 inversions. Um, and obviously, the more inversions you do, the better uh, your observables are. So it's still gaining by doing this. Mm -hmm. But but it, it, it's really slow and it's really annoying, particularly if you've got a wall time for your computer and you yeah. can't get this out. No, but yes. Good. Okay, any other questions? All right. So thank our speaker again. Uh, now, if I can have a show of hands. Uh, yes. Good. I'm going to have a show of hands of those who'd like to join us for dinner at Prime 16. Uh, I guess I should draw a quick picture where it is. So um, here's the New Haven Green, and there's a road that goes right through the middle of it. We're up this way. Uh, the New Haven Hotel is down here. Um, here's the Omni Hotel, which only really well-funded researchers staying at, so I'm not sure that that's any of us. Uh, and right across from the Omni Hotel, uh, and by the way, here's Phelps Gate, for those of you that got dropped off here in the old part of campus. Um, I guess I should say this is north. Good. And here's Prime 16. If Okay. The Marriott is over here. There's campuses like this, the Elm Street, and uh, 
Okay. So, anyways, if you have a if you have a mapping program on your cell phone, like all people do these days, for the most part, you can find it. Okay. Finally, show of hands uh, for me making the reservation. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> All right, 18. All right, 19, me. Okay, we may end up at two tables, but that's good. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, so what I would like to do for the few minutes remaining for the open mic session is call Rich to come up. Uh, so you have to stop working. Okay, that, that will only take a brief moment. So Rich mentioned to me that just in hearing the Todd discussions this morning, he came up with a few exciting questions for Food for Thought. Uh, so this is the very highly truncated version of our uh, open mic where Rich uh, uh, raises the burning questions of the workshop. Okay. Okay. Actually, I thought we were going to run out of time, so I forgot my questions. Uh, <laughs> So um, you have only five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I guess uh, one of my questions. Well, oh, can we turn it on. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a comment more than a question, but here's my impression: is um, Actually, I'll, I'll raise the question. I was at a workshop called uh, Facing Strong Dynamics. There are other uh, gauge theories beside QCD. And uh, Martin Lucier actually gave a talk where he started off. I don't think it's something he's written up. Uh, does this, this doesn't work? Yeah, OK. So uh, he started off a talk asking, what do we do when we get to really huge lattices? And uh, although I didn't really understand his answer, nor do I necessarily believe he has the answer. I don't think he does either. Uh, I think one question is, uh, what do we have to worry about when we go to really huge lattices, OK? And I think that the worries are not refinements of our present method, except I would say that the multi-level method is clearly part of it. And that is to say, uh, you know, clearly we do know, in principle, how to invert a matrix with multi-grid or things like that uh, al algorithmically rapidly, which only scales like the volume of the lattice. Right? I mean, that's the ideal, OK? Now, uh, it's, I think, on the other hand, if you look at the methods, however wonderful they are for HMC, it seems to me that we're polishing an algorithm which has been around a long time. But we're not breaking out of <laughs> its basic bottleneck, which is sometimes ignored. I mean, it doesn't matter how fast you can do the time stepping if your autocorrelations are really slow. And I think they are necessarily slow, slow because it's a local algorithm really in disguise. I mean, you call it MD, but you're just making small changes. So one question, I think, is um, multi-scale for HMC. That's a big question, OK? And we're going to have one talk, uh, a modest talk tomorrow. I don't know if the talk won't be modest, but a modest step on putting just the multi-grid inverter into HMC. But that's not a multi-scale HMC algorithm. Uh, we actually know multi-scale Mont uh, Monte Carlo algorithms. Uh, for example, the cluster algorithm that's been used by Swenson Wang. So we know out there in the space of algorithms exist these wonderful things which actually do much better. That is, to they, they find collective variables which are um, non-local. And multi-grid does find collective variables. But there, yeah, there, there's also, um, I'm blanking out. There's also um, Robert Edwards' advisor. Why am I blanking out his name? Sokol, thank you. Who seems Sokol actually once wrote down a multi-grid algorithm for I think phi four theory, that actually did uh, do the update on different levels. Uh, so anyway, um, that that's one of my questions, and I think that, um, okay, 
Th that's one question. The other question is that even within, this is the one that Losher uh, raised, even with HMC, uh, the accept reject step here, he pointed out, uh, will not be accurate enough on a large lattice in double precision. You will not actually know <laughs> whether or not uh, to accept reject when the lattice gets large. By the way, I don't think this is, you know, distant future. Lattices are sort of getting up to 500 to the fourth very soon. They have to be that way if you're going to be in physical pions. God help us, we're actually doing beyond the standard model where we have actually exponential scales. <laughs> um, and uh, so, I mean, uh, not only is CG um, global sums sort of not necessary, in fact, they're counterintuitive because there's nothing global about inverting a sparse matrix. They're really probably, I'm just raising this a question, probably nothing really intrinsically logical in doing a global accept reject on the energy. Particularly if you think that you're going in a limit, which we haven't approached yet, but when the pi on mass gets to be physical enough, we'll want to make the volume big relative to the correlation length, right? And if the volume is big relative to the correlation length, then in fact, the energy is not globally correlated, right? <laughs> And it would be wonderful to be able to go to a thousand to the fourth lattice and say that we could use this lattice because it had many, many correlation lengths in it, right? And that would be perfectly algorithmically desirable if, in fact, we could do it, the work in the order of volume of the lattice, <laughs> okay? So I know I'm just raising big questions, but, um, okay, so that's, so I, I think we're kind of, you know, polishing this beautiful HMC algorithm, but anybody who can get out of it, um, that's uh, a good idea. Uh, let me see, what other questions? Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, I guess these are very less things that, that, that struck me. Oh, I'm, well, okay. Um, no, I, I, I guess that's the main thing. Actually, one thing I wondered when uh, uh, Michael Kreutz was on the line, but I don't think he is anymore, uh, the, it was, staggered was only mentioned a little bit in passing. And, uh, I've always um, disliked staggered fermions. But there are, in lower dimensions, there are staggered fermions that don't have full doubling because the lattices are different. And I think Michael Kreutz has been thinking about different lattices. I'm not sure there's really any solution in four dimensions. Maybe in five dimensions, who knows, okay? But I think that staggered fermions are not just naive staggered fermions, okay? So that's another thing. Anyway, anybody have any other big questions? Those are my questions. I'm not supposed to answer them. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll actually give you some hint of what I think about in terms of uh, multigrid on HMC. Um, why is multigrid dynamics difficult? Basically, I think because our collective variables are God known, are unknown functions of the original gauge variables. Right, so although the coarse operator is a functional of the fine gauge fields, if we want to do a dynamics on it, we would like to be able to take the derivative <laughs> of the functional of the coarse operator with respect to the fine variables. I think we'd like to do that, okay? But it is um, an awful uh, functional. In the old uh, failing, quote failing uh, multigrid, we actually had simpler functionals for smooth configurations, namely like one level down. So one question I have is whether, if we get the smooth enough lattices, whether we should give up on adaptive multigrid and go back to the old one that actually succeeded as long as the, the degrees of freedom were, were, were uh, smooth, right? So there may be two regimes when we get the very large lattices where we're basically in a perturbative regime until we get to a non-perturbative regime, right? And maybe at that point, um, something like finite elements will even work. But take, get, get somebody else speak. I have a, here's a question. Well, well question. I will just, okay. in the spirit of the open mic, I will make a brief comment, and anybody else wants to come make a brief comment. That Rich and I have talked about this idea of, like, for example, if you wanted to do uh, evolution on the coarse grid in some kind of multi-grid idea, um, it 
makes me think of it, uh, a lot about a lot of the original ideas about Wilsonian renormalization group and blocking and blocked actions. Of course, we all know uh, renormalization group is one way. So even if I could evolve on the course grid, I don't know how to uh, do the inverse blocking step that takes me back to the fine grid. Um, uh, but um, in the spirit of Wilsonian renormalization group, essentially if I can uh, de define a, a core, an action, a much more complicated action, but if I can find all of the coefficients of the very complicated action on the course grid, and then I can actually have the benefit of physics described on the fine lattice, uh, except I only have to do the calculation on the coarse lattice. This, so this is, in, in some sense, like the perfect action approach. I get the benefit of, of continuum physics, but it's encoded in some very complicated action uh, on, on a coarse lattice. And one of the things that I would be nice is I, I haven't seen in the multi-grid discussion if is there some way to think about uh, or marry uh, the Wilsonian RG picture of things with the multi-grid picture of things so that while I'm doing all this work uh, defining uh, a coarse grain system to help me do calculations about my fine grain system that I could also be calculating the coefficients uh, of a, a Wilsonian blocked action that would allow, you know, so that after I've done all this work starting from some fine grain, I would then know a lot about how to simulate uh, the system, a coarse grain system. Uh, so that's something that I've been trying to think about, but it's not clear to me that these, um, uh, that these, that, that they really, whether to the extent that they really are the same idea or not, and how easily you can marry the two ideas. So anyways, that's something that I've been trying to think about. Uh, anybody else have any comments or questions they want to raise? OK. If you want to raise, you can briefly. If you have something more to say, you should well, get the mic. Just, say, this sounds like a great new stock, but I think that to some extent you're slightly creeping into this and even without something. You can take the fermion uh, uh, force, which is very long range, right? I mean, in Hasenbusch, we take the fermion force, it has very long range, right? Then we divide and multiply by a heavier mass, right? And what we're really trying to do is to segregate different distance scales, right? Now, it, it's very crude. It's not collective variables quite, right? But we know it's a good idea, right? So to some extent, one approach to this might be to have a, it's almost, a, it's almost have, a, have an operator which represents the fine grain uh, fermion operator, then an operator that represents a coarse grain, which you divide and multiply as a, on a determinant, right? And it might look something like Hasenbusch, and you would have different pieces of the Hamiltonian that would operate on each scale. But you would have some identity so that uh, there was a cancellation, as Hasenbusch does, right? Hasenbusch cancels out the force terms for the heavy masses, right? Because he calculates them in the inverse and then again, right? So you could imagine where you have a coarse grain thing, which somehow preconditions in an analytic way the fine grain. <laughs> And then you put it back in, and now you, but it, if it's really truly going to be new dynamics, what you want to do is have more momentum variables corresponding to the different levels. So in a sense, it's like the multi, uh, more like the uh, square root, the nth root trick, right? right. So I, I think that if you want to go to multi-level dynamics, you want to think about, there's no reason why we only introduce one momentum per U matrix, right? You can also introduce more and more momenta at different scales. And if you're clever enough, <laughs> big clever thing, maybe you can couple these in such a way that it's still the same dynamics after you integrate out the extra variables. In other words, you integrate in new variables <laughs> to use them in order to accelerate the thing. And by the way, if you look at the simple Swenson-Wang cluster algorithm, it really is that way. You first start with spins, 
then you introduce bonds in such a way that if you were to sum them back out, you get the same partition function. And then you say, I have this enlarged space of more variables, and you discover if you change the way in which you sample them, you get clusters, right? So if you, to me, the idea is somehow we want to add variables <laughs> into a larger space in such a way that if we integrated them back out, it would do nothing. But with them, they grab longer distance physics in a new Hamilton 